Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. Now this is going to be a big one. This is going to be a daunting one. Uh, it's more daunting for me than it is for you, although saying that I'm presuming there, aren't I? It might be more daunting for you than it is for me, but Jesus, this video is going to be daunting for me. So, we're going to talk about Jungian psychology today. And anyone who has any knowledge of Jungian psychology knows how expansive of a field it is and knows the levels of experience that come with it and knows that you can never get to a full understanding of Jungian psychology because it's that expansive. And it could be argued also in the expanse of Jungian psychology, it almost encapsulates all other fields, all other knowledge claims within it. It's it's almost that big because of the very concepts that I'm going to talk about in this video and the ideas of the archetypes which are tied to instinct and therefore uh, the instincts are those things in which create the entirety of all the subjects that we have at our disposal and therefore the Jungian idea of the instinct uh, of the archetypes which are um, psycho instinctual phenomena let's say so psychological phenomena of the instincts um, those are the things that therefore encapsulate all the other subjects and so uh, from a Jungian perspective the whole Jungian idea encapsulates everything else in it which is ridiculously advanced as a as a field as a concept and Jungian psychology is way 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 beyond its time um it's it's like a, it should should have been done a thousand years later not now no one can grasp it now no one has the the um ability to grasp all of what Jungian psychology means i don't personally even think jung had the ability to grasp all of what it meant and he actually said to um uh, I forget the guy's first name, but it was Wheelwright. Anyway, he was a, he was an analyst, and he was one of the Jungian analysts who worked with Jung. And I, f I forget his first name, Joseph Wheelwright. That was I think it was Joseph Wheelwright. And uh, Jung and him were sat down one afternoon when Jung was fairly old. He was in his eighties, uh, only a couple of years before he died. And uh, he said to, to Joseph, um, you know, he, he presented his little finger and he said. You know, all of the knowledge that I have could be placed on the tip of this finger here. And if you aren't aware of Carl Jung and aren't aware of the expanse of his personality and the expanse of what he knew, I'll run through some of the things that he was interested in. So um, he was trained in, in medicine. And then he went on to train in, in uh, psychiatry and become a psychiatrist. Back when it wasn't fashionable to become a psychiatrist, um, he founded uh, along with, well, not along with Sigmund Freud, but he was involved with Sig Sigmund Freud from about 1906, 1907 to 1913 when they had their split based on a uh, difference in the unconscious and, and their ideas about the unconscious. Jung went down the religious route. Freud did use mythology as a way to uh, represent kind of ideas in the unconscious, but he didn't ever go as far as um, ever really liking religion specifically. Um, and so... Uh, he w he was kind of involved in psychology and the the foundings of uh, certain kind of psychoanalytic ideas, specifically his own school of analytical psychology. But you could also argue he was kind of slightly involved with Freudian concepts and building those a little bit as well from the conversations he would have had with Sigmund Freud uh, and the friendship he built up over those five, six, seven years. Um, so he was involved in psychiatry, psychology, um, he was incredibly well read on mythology, he started uh, his mythological studies and he did those over I believe it was 16 years, or no it was in his alchemical studies that were 16 years that he did them over, but he was incredibly well read in mythology as well over a number of years um, doing research on mythology, as I just mentioned 16 years uh, over a period of 16 years doing research on alchemy, um, he was uh, incredibly good at sort of practical things as well, like carpentry, um, he could actually uh, carve stone as well, he, he carved a huge block of stone, uh, and it's actually um, 
there is a book about it as well by uh, Maud Oaks, I can never say that name, M-A-U-D, um, who they went to visit him in the, the 1950s, I believe the late 50s, um, it was around his 75th birthday, there was a documentary done on it, and he was carving this stone. And it's kind of, she, she's kind of entitled it The Stone That Speaks uh, in her book. I don't know whether Young particularly had, had titled it that. But it's basically, um, it, it's got alchemical uh, references carved into the stone with Mercurius, the kind of centre of uh, alchemy, the, the figure of alchemy in the middle of a circle with three little rivers going off. And then there's also like a little river that goes like that. And so it's representative, um, specifically it's representative of almost the Philosopher's Stone in a way, and it's representative of the idea of enlightenment or of, of the idea of the magnum opus in alchemy being um, the unconceptual because there's a, I believe it's either a Latin or a Greek inscription on one of the sides, the side that is, so you've got the side with the, the circle on with Mercurius there, and then you've got, I think, this side here, the left side, with that inscription on, um, talking about how um, I am an old man, yet I'm a child at the same time. My nature is kind of antithetical to itself. There's kind of all that idea that is on the inscription on the stone that is still at Bollingen, as far as I'm aware. I doubt it will have been moved or anything like that. So, um, You've got that idea on there um, with, with uh, particularly showing as well, showcasing his ability with alchemy. Now, he was also incredibly uh, good with languages. Uh, he knew Latin. He was six years old when he learned Latin. He obviously knew he, uh, German as well. He knew English. Uh, he knew a lot of ancient languages, uh, Greek, things like that. Um, I don't know about any other ones, but I'm pretty sure there is actually a couple of other languages he knew. So he, he knew like literally five, six, seven languages. Um, he was interested in zoology. He was interested in archaeology. He was in, interested in anthropology. Um, he knew about many, many different cultures and about the um, the beginnings of different cultures and uh, how they, they sprung up. He was intensely interested, of course, in religion, knowing about Gnosticism, knowing about Christianity, all incredibly in-depth. Gnosticism, Christianity, Taoism, Zen. Uh, he, start, he really started his studies in Zen um, after his wife died or around the time of his wife dying which I believe was in the early 50s but again I'd have to double check um, you know so he was interested in all these different religions and, he, and when I say interested I don't mean that he had some sort of superficial understanding I mean that he read them like crazy but he went so deep into them um of course he was read on some of the mystics as well although he kind of tried to separate himself a little bit uh from mysticism of course there is a bit of that in his books but he um always kind of thought about himself as an empiricist and as a scientist rather than necessarily a mystic although of course, he, he he interwove mysticism and religion and spirituality into a scientific understanding. Now, of course, because he had uh, a good knowledge of the human body because of his days of studying medicine and studying um, psychiatry and things like that, um, he was able to use that knowledge and interweave it with all the different ideas in religion, all the different ideas that he found within uh, like cultural studies and studies within anthropology and also his studies in alchemy and all these different things and mythology as well, like I said. He was able, able to interweave these together and create this incredible philosophy or this incredible psychology uh, that was almost as if you would synthesize science in a completely natural way. So what I mean by this is, in the scientific tradition, as we've got more and more towards the modern day, from the 1600s or so, we've got further and further away from nature. And although we try and observe things and we try and get as close to reality as we can there's more and more of this objective tint on things in terms of um we we use science as 
a way to progress away from nature. Technology is a perfect example of this. We use our understanding of science and all these things to create certain things that are uh, antithetical to nature and the base nature of, 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 the, of planet Earth instead of integrating nicely within it. Whereas Jungian psychology pulled all these things together in as objective way as possible. And of course, uh, we can't necessarily deem it specifically as a science. I, I won't be one to say that. Um, but at least it was trying to get to that level of um, complete scientific understanding but in a very very natural setting in a very kind of um in the setting of nature um but we have this idea obviously that we're we're moving away from nature and we're science is disintegrating with nature rather than actually being a force for good around nature and actually understanding it fully and then being able to blossom something out of that now that's not to say there isn't good work going on here and there with scientists who are doing that there is but you know there is a lot of this kind of pulling away from nature so what he did was he made these concepts that were based uh, around all of his incredible understanding and pulled them all together into this unity, into this united philosophy that speaks for the wholeness of the individual and for the psychology and the development of the psychology of the individual. Uh, and he used all the different traditions we have at our disposal. He even used things like physics and stuff like that in, in small ways, specifically some of the other Jungians and also his wife, Emma Jung, uh, was interested in physics and specifically Mar uh, Marie Louise von Franz and, and Emma Jung were the two who were more uh, involved with, with bringing physics into Jungian psychology, but specifically also Jung did have an understanding of that. And of course, he was he was uh, good friends with Wolfgang Pauli, uh, who helped him with his idea of synchronicity, which again, I might not cover in this video, actually, synchronicity, but maybe in another one. And so um, he also had a bit of an understanding of physics from his chats with, with Wolfgang Pauli. And, um, and so uh, we have this incredible expanse of all these things into this one philosophy in which is so rich and so incredible and so um, just brimming with what it means uh, to, to live almost as well. So let us get on with some of the concepts. Now, I was always, um, first off, I was always spec uh what's the word not speculative um not cynical but what's the word i was always skeptical i knew it would come to me i would always i was always skeptical of um the idea of the collective unconscious and I thought, no, well, you know, I, I'm looking at this and I just can't fully see it. I see it, I see it, I see it, and I want to believe it. But I can't just believe, you know, I can't just, like, think, yes, I believe this. You, people know how bloody analytical I am. I just, I have to create a bloody bulletproof thing out of something before I actually know it and before I think, yes, uh, this is right. So... Uh, that's what I decided to do. I decided to go into it and go into it and go into it. And that's where Revelations of the Self came from, my own book on it, because I wanted to really hone down this and get it in my mind as I know that this thing exists or I know it doesn't exist. So the idea of the collective unconscious, there's two ideas of it. There's, you, can, you can have more of an atheistic, disjointed view of it, or you can have more of a spiritual unity view of it. Now, Jung didn't really touch on this too much, and this is why I wanted to look into Jungian psychology, and I wanted to formulate um, more of a, uh, an expansive view in terms of proving it in some way, and you can never really prove anything, but proving it in, you know, air quotes, in um, atheistic terms and also in spiritual terms. 
so obviously a lot of the uh, groundwork in the in the book that I've done, Revelations of the Self, is going into the different ways we are connected and we are uh, unified. So to kind of uh, really get an understanding of, oh yes, there is some sort of collective unconscious. So I talk a lot about, um, obviously, first of all, our ecological unity. I talk a lot about um, the fact that we're all made of certain chemicals. Um, and so... Uh, we have a, a basis of uh, collective nature in that the fact that we you know we've all got like sodium and potassium and carbon and oxygen and water and all that within us and we all have those collective let, let's say those collective uh, chemicals within us i talk about loads of things I, I think in the end there was about seven or eight uh pretty structured arguments i made simply for the atheistic version of the collective unconscious. Now, what is the atheistic version of collective unconscious compared to the spiritual version? Well, the atheistic version is simply that we have all of these collective structures within us that Jung talked about um, that direct our behaviour as instinctual forces. And um, and there need not be, as far as I'm aware, in, in what I've looked at and what I've uh, done within Revelations of the Self, there need not be a spiritual twang to Jungian psychology. Now, I'm very well aware that at this point I'm almost playing the Antichrist to Jungian psychology because it's meant to be a spiritual, um, uh, you know, it's meant to be a spiritual subject or a spiritual field. But I thought it was very important to get an atheistic viewpoint on Jungian psychology because of. Uh, the main tenant, let's say, to Jungian psychology and to Jung's ideas, which is the unity of opposites and the uh, balance of, of the opposites as well. And, and holding that tension of the opposites, as Jung talks about. So um, I think that providing an atheistic viewpoint on Jungian psychology, in fact, oddly enough, is partially antithetical to, to what Jungian psychology means, but also it's exactly in line with what it means as well because what really Jungian psychology means is inclusiveness and acceptance and a withdrawal of projections and uh, an ability to gain a whole psychology of your own and you're not going to be able to do that unless you've explored all different avenues and been able to accept them as fundamental possibilities of existence or of reality and whatever reality may turn out to be that's what it turns out to be but you have to have the good nature and the acceptance and a philosophical um i don't know philosophical morality that's not quite the word, word that i'm looking for but the philosophical good nature just to be able to be well-rounded and to be balanced and to be you know um quite being able to see all different arguments. So um, I think we'll start with the fundamental concepts of Jungian psychology and then we'll go from there. So Jung basically had the idea that we have all of these instincts, right? We have the instinct for curiosity and we have the, the instincts of anger and fear and, you know, fight or flight response. In fact, now, if you look at the scientific literature, uh, what's slowly becoming slightly more favoured is actually fight um, flight response in the male and attend or de uh, or befriend response in the female. That's what the literature is starting to say these days. Um, and that actually fits very, very well with what you can observe empirically, and, and rightly so, because if that's what we've found, uh, then that's what should be observed empirically, as you would expect. So that's what's kind of being more found out with regards to the the woman and the man. Now, of course, we will get into a socialised perspective on, um, on these things as well. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave that out. I'm not going to... Um, push that to the side, I want to be as all-inclusive as I can with this video. Um, but for now, we're looking at the biological viewpoint, and we're looking at a viewpoint in which says uh, the instincts and in our biology does affect our behaviour and does orient us in a certain way. And then 
will look at more of a socialized viewpoint on that or rather i should say uh, as well an integratory social uh, socialized viewpoint on it or social constructivist viewpoint on it um which is something that i've kind of started to work out within revelations of the self and started to construct an argument around that actually is quite uh, interesting so anyway the basis of it is we've got these genes and within the genes we've got certain instinctual drives and they of course are within us within our physiology uh, and therefore we can have behavior based on those so, for example, the sexual instincts, we all know we have a desire for sex. Um, these things, you know, they're, they're obviously very uh, cemented in our understanding. They're nothing particularly crazy or anything like that. When we talk about the instincts, we're aware of them. So, Jung thought that there were structures based on these instincts. And so... What we can talk about first off is, let's say that what we have is we kind of have the two main archetypes, let's say, aside from when we're looking at what's known as the mana personality, which we'll look at in a minute. We have the two kind of main archetypes. Now, Jung, I don't believe, specifically said this. He may have done somewhere, but I don't think he specifically said this, but... He did say that obviously the archetypes as a psychological phenomenon align and make good analogies with the instincts. And that's what he says in Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious. But he didn't really ever go into elaborate detail on the ones that align up with certain archetypes, right? But you could say somewhat. Now, the animus is more of a expansive... Um, archetype than just this but if you are aligning the animus with one particular uh instinct you would say maybe the instinct for fight that would be more the animus because the animus is also the spirit the um the thing that comes into reality and is the meaning the logos and um maybe let's say that there's an idea present the, the spirit turns the idea into a rea reality. The animus is the one with the, the drive and the spirit for, for um, doing things and going out there. And so you could, you could very, very easily um, kind of pair that with the, the instinct for fight. Now, the anima is the instinct... Um, it could well could be associated with the tendon befriend, befriend instinct that is now coming through in scientific literature. Very very closely associated with the anima, the, the way in which the anima operates, and the anima is the eros principle, the life principle, and um, is associated or can be associated with ideas and can be associated with um, the kind of the enrapturement by ideas that we have now of course the animus is the masculine the anima is the feminine now we'll talk about the idea of the socialization or social constructivist well yeah more of a socialization viewpoint rather than specifically social constructivist although maybe there's a bit of that in there really but we can talk about the idea that the anima and the animus a priori don't have any gender or don't or rather don't have any association to the biological sex but that actually they are socialized from birth and therefore because of our society the animus has been socialized into the masculine the anima the yeah the anima uh into, into the feminine uh and therefore that's a socialized viewpoint on the archetypes which doesn't invalidate the archetypes it still means that the archetypes are very much correct and very much true now the other argument the more extremist argument which particularly i don't really follow is be just because of how obvious and empirical the instincts are uh, and how obviously they align to the archetypes as well in in, in observable experience um, and I'll talk about that as we get deeper into the concepts. The view I don't hold is that, well, 
all the archetypes are invalidated, all of the collective unconscious idea is invalidated um, by a, a social constructivist viewpoint. It's we know there's instincts there, and we know that instincts compel our behaviour in certain ways, and therefore, if those instincts align up to a certain psychological phenomena that we could label anima or animus, because that's all, all that is, is it a label, but it's a label for a specific particular complex behaviour uh, that could be determined as archetypal, you know, instinctual, etc., um, but it seems that, that that's just not the case at all. That doesn't really work. It doesn't, that argument doesn't go anywhere because of the fact we know of our instincts. And also, if we're talking, if we're arguing for the biological viewpoint, and really I can argue both for the socialised viewpoint or the biological, not that extremist socialised viewpoint. I don't agree with that myself personally, but I can argue for an integrative uh, socialized viewpoint, or I can argue for a biological viewpoint. I don't mind which I particularly argue for, um, but going arguing for the biological viewpoint for a second, where this socialized viewpoint falls down is in the maternal instinct. We know there is a maternal instinct biologically that affects a woman's behavior, and if that is the case, and therefore obviously if that maternal instinct is associated with the anima, which it is, because the feminine, obviously, as we've just talked about in the literature, the um, the instincts associated are with this tend or befriend attitude, which is the anima in, in a lot of what it means, that complex form of instinctual behaviour uh, is, therefore, we can label the anima. Uh, it seems that this socialised perspective doesn't fit automatically, immediately. And so then we think, well, we really need to produce a, a better argument for the social for the extremist, let's say, socialization viewpoint if we're going to go down that route. Because and clearly a lot of the literature as well, um I've I've looked at a few pieces of literature that have been based on uh studies of the, the differentiation of the brain between the man and the woman, and it's clear in the literature that there is differences within the brain. And I understand the argument, the whole testosterone rex argument, Cordelia Fine, very good argument, um, and it's possible that obviously therefore uh, certain things don't necessarily affect our behaviour, let's say we're going with that argument for example, maybe testosterone, oestrogen, things like that, maybe they don't direct our behaviour um, in as big a way as we think, but if we go one step back and we look at the instincts specifically, not necessarily chemicals in the body but the instincts we can see a different story and so therefore that argument starts to it, it needs more refining it needs looking at the instincts more it needs looking at things um further back and it needs tweaking and things like that but it is a very good argument and there definitely are elements of it that um, I think actually could be very powerful within the context of Jungian psychology and within actually understanding certain elements of Jungian psychology in a completely different way that, you know, personally myself or other people might be a little bit um, negative towards in, in viewing them in, in that specific way, although I'm very open to experiencing them in that, in that way but obviously it does mean leaving my pride at the door if it comes to that. And that's something that you have to do. And you have to get over certain things within yourself and be open to whatever possibility it is. So anyway, the anima of the Eros principle, the life principle, um, that, you know, we could we could identify that with the feminine. So let's just look at a biological viewpoint for now. So the anima is the, the woman and the animus essentially is the man. And the animus will be conscious for the man. So that means that the animus is in the, the masculine's consciousness, and that's what they portray to the world. And the animus is in the, the conscious of the woman. Now that means that in the unconscious of the man, the animus resides. And Jung talks about this in the idea that the man has an inferior amount of feminine genes. And so because the man has an inferior amount of fem feminine genes, uh, that means that they obviously portray the instinct towards 
the animus rather than the anima, and the anima is within the unconscious of the individual. Now, the problem with Jung is he talks about this in a very, very um, poetic way, an almost spiritual way at times as well. Sometimes he t- talks about it more scientifically, but then other times he'll go into this very spiritual, poetic flow, and it really distorts, in my view, correct understanding of it. It's not he com- he communicates it in um, a very weird and very spiritual manner sometimes, but. He talks about how the ultimate masterpiece of individuation, the ultimate aim, is for an individual in their psychological growth to pull out of the unconscious the anima, let's say, for a man, or pull out the unconscious if for a woman the animus, because in the woman the animus is in the unconscious because she's got an inferior amount of masculine uh, genes, right? So, uh, male genes. So... When we're talking about the anima and the animus, let's just talk about them a little bit more. What are the kind of the characteristics of the anima uh, compared with the the animus? So the anima is emotional, is, um, you could also say, like we just said before, is sort of tender, is... Anything that associate anything that's associated with those traditional traits of the feminine that now can be called quite stereotypical, and we have to be careful of this within the biological viewpoint because it can be called stereotypical. It can be called out and things like that. But from what I can certainly see, it seems like certainly from the biological viewpoint, if we're looking at this angle, that there is those discernible traits in the woman and then the man is is something different. So it's all really, we don't need to worry about it too much. It's all the general traits that we know about men and women, essentially. We might not be able to go quite that far because some of those traits that we know may be socialised, and in fact they possibly are, but there are certain things with the anima and the animus that are um, instinctual and that are therefore of their own product. Now, the animus, uh, in its kind of characteristic behaviour, is overbearing. Uh, And we see this with young men quite a lot who've got quite an immature relationship to their animus because even though it's in consciousness, they're still quite young and they're still quite overbearing with it. Uh, So we see this in the young men who can be quite overbearing and quite... um, uh, kind of spirited, and again, that's where the, the animus, the spirit um, idea comes in as well. Uh, they can be quite spirited and they'll, they'll be overbearing and be out there and all the rest of it. Um, the animus is also the logos principle, which is which means meaning, um, which means that essentially it can also be in a mature version of the animus. The animus is philosophical, it's very considered, it's almost got that sagely manner to it, essentially. And we see this more in slightly older men who uh, are more mature um, and have have got that kind of philosophical nature of of the instinct, of the animus instinct. Um, And so they're they're more well-grounded, they're they're more kind of uh, considered with things and, and they've got less of that slightly more immature animus. Although what does tend to happen is that the overbearing nature for the animus, which is at first in early years, uh, and when I say early years, I mean even into your 20s, um, at first is quite immature and quite overbearing in a certain way. It still remains like that, but it the overbearingness gets converted um, into a slightly more mature philosophical fashion, but the overbearingness is still there as a part of the animus. Um, so that's that, and, and that associates quite nicely, actually, with the, f- the fight instinct. Um, and the anima is the emotional, the um, very loyal, the tender, the um, almost the, the considered feeling uh, individual. The animus has less of that kind of considered feeling nature. The anima is more the emotional, the, the feeler, the, um, and also the loyal um, party, because the anima... 
essentially sees the animus. This is what Jung talked about, and it's a very, very good example, because don't forget, I've been socialised into the feminine, so I have always been an anima. I've, n I've not been an animus, so I've always looked at other men as in the way that the anima looks at other men. So I can, which has been brilliant and just perfect for me understanding Jungian psychology. Um, so I very much know the idea of the anima and how the anima uh, looks at, at the, the animus, let's say, and how there is also this loyalty because the anima looks at the animus as some sort of almost godly figure. There is this loyalty of wanting to provide, of wanting to um, help, of wanting to do their bit, let's say. And again, this gets back into very, very traditional ideas of the man and the woman and all this sort of stuff. But there is certainly this, uh, within the anima, there is this kind of projection onto it. Now, of course, if we're looking at a socialization viewpoint and the anima and the animus being sex free, but then that are socialized into the sexes, then we could see, well, hang on, this isn't traditional or this isn't stereotypical in any way, because actually this could be, this could happen for either a man or a woman. Um, a woman, for example, getting socialized into the animus and therefore projecting the anima out. Um, and so you can you can see this in, in different ways. Now, I'm not going to get into sexuality and the psychic structures um, or the archetypes as well, um, because I have looked into that like you wouldn't know what. And my conclusion, and I've wrote this in Revelations of the Self in a more articulated and more constructive way, is that sexuality isn't related to a complex or isn't related to an animal or the animal or the animus or the archetypes. I'm not going to go into that here, but when I publish Revelations of the Self, all this information and way more, like way more intricately is going to be in there. The only thing I can do in this video is call to memory what I've understood from that book and what I've written in that book. And it, this video is never going to be perfect and never going to be able to really give a strong case or really, uh, help you understand in a very, very strong and directed way the Jungian ideas. But what will do that is the book that, that I'm writing. And I'm, I'm nearly finished, actually. It shouldn't be too long now. Um, but I've not wrote for quite a few days because I've not felt it. And I talked about in my philosophy of writing video how I don't write when I don't feel it. So I've, I've just not done that. Um, so anyway... Um, so we've got that kind of socialization viewpoint anyway, and, and as I say, sexuality, I don't believe from looking at it enough, is actually incredibly related to, of course there are relations of sexuality to the psychic structures, because ultimately we are all individualized um, bodies of archetypes, shall we say, so my genes are have within them an individualization, an individualization in instincts and therefore I am compelled in my behavior to do things in a certain way based on the differentiation I have within my genes and then obviously within my brain and my neurological structure for a certain instinct or for a certain set of instincts whereas someone else is individualized physiologically and genetically for uh, another way of, of looking at the instincts and so therefore or, or, or another way of behavior because of certain instincts um so uh therefore you know it, it, it's we're always gonna sexuality is always gonna link to them somewhat but i don't think it links to them in the way that some people think in terms of complexes and stuff like that now, um, I say some people because it was Jung's idea that, and, and this is of course an outdated idea now, and it's why I st uh, really strove for, I don't know if strove is a word, but I was striving for so long to get an understanding of sexuality um, within the Jungian idea of it, um, aside from Jung's idea, because I thought it was outdated, his, his way of thinking of it. Um, and so his idea was that... Uh, sexuality basically is from 
uh, or let's say let's say homosexuality specifically is from a socialization into the anima and then a projection of the animus out onto another man so that then you because you've been socialized into the anima and so you want to uh attain the animus externally the the meaning let's say you're let's say the the life principle that uh you've you've gained more of the instincts via socialization and by reinforcement by behavioral reinforcement um the you know the tend or befriend instincts that what it means to be feminine and so you you need to try and tame the masculine to balance that and so you you're, you're then you've gone down that route of sexuality i don't believe that based on my own experiences of course um and and i've tried to really look into that really try and you know do 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 look into that um and i i don't i don't think that's the case i think there's a good argument for it and i think there's certain aspects of it that do align up and that do work but i don't think it's a be all and end all i don't think that it's particularly right i think that complexes can orient your sexual behavior and can make you feel as if you're one sexuality or another but i don't think it's the full truth I don't think it's the full truth, and believe me, I've looked into it so much, so much, I, I introspect so much, I think so much, and I only state things that I really have, have, have thought about, um, and that is something I've really thought about, and that's what I see, and I'm so happy to be able to state that that's what I have observed, because I would hate to have had to have said that sexuality comes from a complex but i would say that if if i had thought enough on it and that's what that's the conclusion i drew i would say homosexuality or um uh, some other form of sexuality comes from a mother complex or comes from a father complex or whatever i would say that if it came to it if i knew that that was that was what what happens but i don't think it is based on um my own experience and my own introspection based on my experience and my own reading based on psychology and philosophy of course um so i don't think that's the case but anyway so so We've got the anima, we've got the animus, we've got the, the anima as the feminine, we've got the animus as the masculine, if we're going on a biological viewpoint, if we're going on a socialised viewpoint, we've got these two psychic structures that have been socialised into a given individual, let's say. Um, now, even in the biological viewpoint, there can be socialization into the opposite psychic structure. So, for example, let's say I'm a man uh, and um, I have... Uh, certain genes that then would mean that automatically from birth I am an animus because I've got those genes. I am a man and therefore within my psychology I'm going to have the, the animus. Well, what can happen, and it's a very, very weird thing that can happen and you can observe it. Well, you have to observe it after the fact in the unconscious, but you can observe it after the fact in the unconscious in which the... As I've mentioned a minute ago, the opposite psychic structure, so the animo in this case, will get socialized in to that individual over childhood. And then that individual will become the will will have become the anima in consciousness, and the animus will have gone in the unconscious. But in this, in the biological viewpoint, because the genes are still differentiated for the masculine, um, it means actually that the unconscious is always trying to push that animus back out into consciousness and put the anima in the unconsciousness because it's almost gone wrong the psychic development's gone wrong and so and this is what the social uh, constructivists don't like when we talk about this because they say well if you're saying that there's a specific way of being and that we we all are born a man and born a woman then there's no uh, that, that kind of is quite harsh and, and not very sympathetic to other gender identities and things like being asexual or, or things like being non-binary or, or stuff like this or gender queer. And it is, it's very true, it is very true. And that's why I've tried to, because we know, we can see all of these gender, um, uh, different genders in an empirical basis. We know that those genders exist. 
we know that people feel like that. We know. I even myself uh, feel somewhat gender fluid quite a lot of the time. I can sometimes feel myself as a woman, sometimes feel myself as a man. I'm not trying to put down any sort of gender uh, identity because I recognize the importance of that and I recognize the fact that that is how people are. Um, and so I'm not trying to put that down at all. But in that view, in the, in the biological view, it does get socialized um, in such a way. And therefore, you could say that other developments are wrong. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that other developments are wrong, because that would presuppose that we knew that a certain normal, a certain normal growth of the individual is or could be labeled right now of course it's it's a conceptual distinction and it simply is a conceptual distinction to say that um a, a normal development is right or, or rather a certain development from birth like that being having differentiated genes for the man or for the woman is right or wrong you see it's actually a product of the archetypes also and differentiation in the individual that leads someone to becoming a different gender identity and so because it's a differentiation of the instincts within the physiology of that individual or, or rather the anatomy of that individual I should say because of that, it can't be right or wrong because it's the very archetypes and the instincts themselves that have led to a, let's say, almost not necessarily evolutionary differentiation, but sort of like an intellectual differentiation in which those individuals can be perceived as that and can feel themselves as that and are um, a certain gender other than masculine or feminine and therefore that means that the idea that it's right to have a normal development or, or, or right to have a certain development because it's biological actually falls down because it, it's that's simply your projection onto it onto what you're viewing the phenomenon you're viewing but actually um if we look at it in a more holistic way, based on the archetypes and also based on their instincts, the fact is that those individuals who end up being non-binary, their instincts worked in a certain way to get them to that level of development, and so it's natural based on the instincts working in, stu in such an individualized way. Do you kind of get what I'm getting at here? So even though there may be a basic level of, of development in the individual or in humanity based on the biological viewpoint of the man becoming the animus and the woman becoming the animal and that's kind of fixed in genetics even so it is the very instincts that work in a specific way in an individual to then get them to becoming non-binary so you see it's a playing of the instincts anyway so it all can be considered as natural whether you're looking at it in one way or whether you're looking at it in another way it's just simply conceptual distinctions that we've placed on it saying that is a normal development so hence that should be right and this is not a normal development so this should be wrong when actually the concept of normality or the concept of right or wrong, do, do, they don't really come into it. It's simply all coming, it's all arising from nature in a certain way. And there may be certain biological um, directions to this that are more, let's say, a priori or slightly a priori at least. Um, but that counts for little when we think about um, the almost the flowering of the individual over time from the basis of their instinctual drives anyway. So therefore you, you, you think like that. And we can also make the argument that if everyone's genetics are differentiated for certain instincts and therefore their brain as a product of those genetics, grown as a product of those genetics, is differentiated to see the world in a certain way based on instincts, then socialization can actually be seen to be quite superficial because when that person is growing up, their brain, because it's differentiated for certain instincts, whatever socialization, whatever context of socialization they're in, all the information they're absorbing, all the experiences they're absorbing in their brain um, is 
basically processed by a certain uh, propensity uh, for an instinct. So for me, it would have been the propensity for the instinct of inquisitiveness. So I will always go into that inquisitiveness first, let's say, or maybe a possibly a couple of other different instincts as well, because it wouldn't just be one. But they're always going to interpret it in that specific way. And that gives us the idea, a very, very interesting idea, that all socialization is superficial. And that actually, um, it's the uh, understanding of the individual based on the differentiation in the brain that then leads them to make specific decisions, even if they're in a socialized context. So it's not socialization um being a dominant factor over someone but actually it's the instinctual differentiation in their brain producing a specific understanding of a situation that then ends up um, making them flower as an individual anyway and and pushing them down certain routes in life regardless of socialization itself um which is a remarkable idea it's a remarkable idea um but anyway so let, let us get further on to this, let us get further into it. So we've got the anima and we've got the animus. So now we need to look at the shadow. Now we're looking at these things in a collective way, which is, so to say, um, the collective structures that we all possess as humans based on, as I've said, the fact that we have all these different chemicals in us, we have all these um, different, uh, we have these genetics uh, that have these collective instincts, okay? So the shadow is, in a, in a collective sense, is the evil. You know, you could associate this really possibly with uh, the instinct of anger and things like this, this very carnal desire. Again, I mean, it bleeds into the instinct of fight as well. Um, Jung also talked about how the instincts bleed into one another. Uh, sorry, how the archetypes bleed into one another. And so um, you may have one particular archetype that, that kind of bleeds into the experience of another. Um, and when we get on to a couple of examples in a little bit about how the archetypes can be perceived as instinctual psychophenomena, psychoinstinctual phenomena um, in present moments, then I'll talk about the whole um idea of how the instincts can bleed into one another in in, that, in those terms and of course we've not touched upon the idea of the archetypes and i don't really know whether i actually mentioned but the archetypes are um basically just tied well yeah i did sorry i did i did talk about that i didn't know about how the archetypes were analogies for the instinct so there we go so they're the, the psychological counterpart to instinct let's say and that's the phrase that jung actually used himself um, but we've got the shadow anyway, and in a collective sense, of course, this is the aggression, the anger, the, the, um, it can also be associated with manipulation and all these you know, negative traits. And in a personal sense, the personal shadow, because we have the collective shadow, which is the real, you know, that real carnal anger, and well, not carnal, but this real anger and this real um, animalistic, that's the word I want to use, animalistic kind of you know, real collective kind of stuff. When you see um, a lion hunting down a gazelle and literally pouncing on it and just ripping it to shreds, that's the collective shadow. That's the, the real anger. That's the real um, base of what the collective shadow means. But when we talk about the personal shadow, the personal shadow is something that builds up um, over the experience of, of youth and it becomes James Hall actually a uh, psychiatrist a Jungian psychiatrist talks about the personal shadow as being sort of like an alter ego and it and it is very much like that actually and it's a rejection of all of the parts of the personality that the individual uh, doesn't want to accept in consciousness as they're going through their development and then slowly normally the psyche kind of integrate them into consciousness over um certainly over kind of their 20s and things like that teenagers 20s and they start to integrate them into conscious consciousness more and in fact a lot of people in a normal development generally have quite a uh, a good conscious relationship with their shadow um i've seen it here more, at university more than anywhere to be honest there's a lot of pe young people who are very very shadowy and they're very accepting of their shadow so i don't just mean they're very shadowy in an, in an unconscious way which would be um 
the fact that actually they're being very, very nice consciously, but actually they've got the shadow in the unconscious and they're, they're, and then it's coming out in other ways, in, in ways that isn't particularly conducive to the individual's uh, success of being uh, a, a whole human being and, and integrating uh, that shadowy side of themselves, which is then based on a collective instinct for aggression or this or that or whatever, or dominance or that rivalry as well. Actually, rivalry is a good instinct to compare it to. Um, so anyway, uh, a, a lot of them are actually quite good with it. So um, for me, I'm going to give you an example of myself because this is the easiest thing that, and I've talked about this in the other video, in another video, but I want to reiterate it because this is the easiest way you can see what I mean by the personal shadow. Bads Robinson, he is my personal shadow. He is my alter ego. He is the shadow. Um, all of the things that I didn't accept in childhood, all of those sexual instincts, all of those things, all of those different, um, more charming uh, almost like slightly subtly assertive natures, things like that, all of that rebellious nature that I didn't accept, that I pushed down, that I repressed, and so it went into the shadow, and it, it gave me uh, Bads Robinson um, in, in a characterization, so that then I could understand it in consciousness. When I say it, I mean, let's say the psyche, my, my own unconscious, bestowed me the idea of Bads Robinson, so that then I could, I could understand it, and I could work through it, and I could um, understand an integration with those shadow elements of myself, and normally you can see this in dreams and fantasies, and we go through dreams and fantasies to be able to work through the shadow, and to be able to actually get integration with the evil and integration with the shadow in a in a large way well not in a large way but you know all those personal aspects you you integrate those um so that then there's not much of it left in the unconscious and uh, of course there's always going to be something in the unconscious because by nature of the unconscious it remains unconscious and so there's always something within there there's always things happening working without your conscious awareness uh, you can never be fully conscious of yourself so long as there's always an unconscious there which there always will be for as long as you live um but that's the shadow that's what it is so i'll talk to you about my first dream experience of coming across the shadow because we've touched upon the archetypes in a very um uh, I suppose almost scientific, kind of scientific way there. I mean, people would argue with me of it being scientific, but, you know, it's a more objective way, let's say, of arguing it, or of, of talking about it at least. So, um, I had a dream uh, once, and this was my first meeting with the collective shadow. And the collective shadow is that raw aggression, that raw evil. And it comes across in dreams very, very prominently. And uh, you'll have an archetypal dream, which is the collective unconscious, which is um, you're going into the instinctual domain of, of man when you're going into the collective unconscious. When you have a personal unconscious dream or a little dream, uh, young partially referred to them because of his uh, studies and his uh, meetings as well with the Nescapi uh, uh, in the Labrador Peninsula. He, he referred to them as big dreams and little dreams as well because that's what the, the Nescapi called them. So the, the big dreams of the archetypal, the collective, the little dreams of the, of the personal unconscious. So the personal unconscious shadow dreams, you know, you might have had a tiff with someone or, I don't know, you might have some sort of unconscious feelings towards someone that are quite negative but that are slightly getting repressed and so your unconscious will produce you a dream and um, it'll it'll set up a scenario in which the, the person who, um, you know, is obviously, you've got these negative feelings around, might be there and um, they might, for example, if the dream's compensatory, because in Jungian psychology there's this very, very prominent idea that the unconscious is compensatory and so therefore, um, because of that, it means that um, dreams essentially will be, um, uh, will be, different to how they are in consciousness or your conscious experience so maybe you've had a tiff with someone maybe in your unconscious and i've had this many times you'll be bestowed a dream of making up with them 
um, because that's your psyche acting as a daily balancing factor um, in which the next day it means you can wake up and your behavior is slightly balanced and it means that you're not you've not got psychic it's some mild form of psychic dis disequilibrium okay so um you might have dreams like that. Um, actually, there was uh, one person I was talking to who had a bit of an argument with a friend, and uh, this person was was a woman, and the friend was a man, and she saw the typical shadowy an animus figure in in one of the dreams, and he, he came at her, and he, something like there was some sort of murder chase or something that she was on looking, and uh, I basically said, you know, look, just talk to this person, maybe try and atone with this person because it may then balance the dreams. That might be one way of doing it. Now, back then, I wasn't as well understood as I am now, so I don't know whether that was good advice or not, but that was one piece of advice I said, you know, because I knew that the individual didn't have a neurosis or anything like that, so I knew there wasn't any level of, of major psychic disequilibrium, so I thought, well, maybe it might be a good idea for um, them to atone in consciousness and see what effect that has on the psyche and the, the unconscious dreams. I didn't actually realize what had happened after that. I didn't talk to her, but um, no, but I don't know. Possibly something did happen. Maybe the dreams went. Maybe she managed to atone with the person. Hopefully, you don't know. But the collective unconscious uh, is where these the more instinctual phenomena lie. So I had this dream where uh, I was kind of being chased by these two wolves so they're like wolves one of them was black and one of them was white of course signifying the union of opposites the yin and the yang all that sort of stuff right so we were fighting what they were kind of like they weren't like yeah i think might have been fighting one another in the dream but then we were kind of like chasing me then we were out on a park and we were chasing around and all the rest of it and then we went to a vet and uh, the black one went into the vets and I went into the vet with it, and um, the vet sat it down and must have put some sort of anaesthetic in it, and he took a um, photograph, like a CAT scan, of the brain of this of this um, wolf, or it might have been a hyena, but I think it was a wolf. It was a long time ago, this dream. I have wrote it down, so I should have possibly accessed it before doing this video, but anyway, he took a picture of that. And then I looked, in this dream, I looked vividly into the middle of the brain of this uh, wolf. And there was this blackness. And in the dream, I felt this harrowing evil. This disgusting evil. This terrible evil. And I woke up and I was crying. I, my, well, my eyes were watering. I don't know whether I was crying but my eyes had, had been watering, like, it must have been while I was having the dream, or just after I'd had the dream, I, I woke up, and I was like, that. Ah, just, I was so, it was just a harrowing feeling, now, it wasn't anything that was actually bad in the dream, really, I was only looking at this image, but it was a harrowing thing, this feeling, and that was my first meeting with the collective shadow, and that wasn't the personal shadow, that was the raw evil of the collective shadow, and the raw you see, the collective shadow, it's constant destruction. It's constant. Imagine the pinnacle of instinctual destruction, um, as expressed from the instinctual instinct for aggression and rivalry. That's the collective shadow. It never ends. It ne the destruction never ends. It's constantly there, constantly present uh, in the unconscious as a force. It's this very, very, uh, very, very um, extremist evil. And it's, it's an archetype that's transcendent of uh, the individualized shadow. We all have our own individualized shadows that we access. Um, many of us rarely, rarely, if ever, get into really what it means about that collective shadow. You could say when we have a, a, a burst, uh, an outburst of uh, anger and things like that, and we really get quite... Um, enraptured by it and taken over by it you could say then we're, we're a bit more in the collective shadow but even so it's very very fleeting um we can course of call to one modern example of someone who was 
in the collective shadow for a time period specifically towards the end of the war as well sort of after like 1942 43 certainly in 44 was when this really started to happen um and that was hitler and he he got enraptured by the collective shadow he wasn't an individual shadow anymore he was a collective shadow he was a representation of pure pure destruction and pure evil that's why at the, towards the end of the war he just ramped up the destruction as jordan peterson has touched upon because he wasn't thinking about himself anymore thinking about it he just he just wanted he thought boom this is gone let's ramp up let's just get this destruction keep keep going with the destruction because he was completely enraptured by it there's even a case to make that um he wasn't even himself like he wasn't like um even in his individual self and what i mean by that is like he didn't even have any rational choice or anything it was like he just this thing just boom went through him now of course it was his rational choice to uh, to do everything leading up to that point so therefore he was st still an incredibly evil man i'm not dismissing that at all by the way um but i'm what i'm saying is that all of his evil events and all of his evil and all of his terrible terrible things that he did led him up to the point of getting incredibly close to that collective shadow but then it just took over and it just boom like that and, uh, and and then towards the end of the war that's why because he was so enraptured by this collective shadow he just ramped up the destruction um and and so that's a good example of the collective shadow working within the individual and it's that very very powerful instinctual aggression that takes a hold of you and it does that um and so the more you, re and, and naturally, even from a behaviorist perspective, the more you're reinforcing, let's say, the personal shadow, the closer and closer you're going to be to the collective shadow. And therefore, that's how it works. The more and more you reinforce, let's say, a certain instinct, like the instinct for inquisitiveness or curiosity, which is aligned to the sage, and also actually uh, antithetically to that, aligns to the child as well, because obviously the curiosity and wonder of the child. That's why the philosopher is so associated with the child, and why the child often draws up philosophical questions on reality, because it's the same instinct working in two different dimensions. But anyway, so... Um, um, let's say you've got that instinct instinct for inquisitiveness the sage then that's going to be reinforced in you and you're going to go along there and so we also ha we have the light and the dark side of these things they obviously the, the negative aspect of the uh, of specifically like the hero or the sage or something like that would be something like the villain um and would be something like the the manipulative villain in the, in the idea of the sage and and therefore um you do have two elements to this and the the pinnacles of let's say these as represented um in sort of uh i don't know tv and stuff you've got like yoda as the typical like archetypal sage figure and then you've got someone like i don't know um you could say like saruman or something like that well maybe not because maybe like um someone slightly different but you've got someone like that who's the typical kind of um villain i mean you could say saruman and um gandalf and so not yeah, Gandalf, yeah, that's right. Or you could say, no, here's a better one. Here's a better one. You've got the typical sage uh, and, and magician as well that aligns with the, the magician um, of, of um, Dumbledore. And then you've got, the, you've got Voldemort as well. And they're the two sides of it. Um, but all, they're almost the same archetype in a way because they both have the same kind of uh, instinctual drives for inquisitiveness and things like that, except... Uh, Dumbledore uses it in a positive way for the benefit of others and, and learns and, and and gains information from an instinctual basis of inquisitiveness for the good of people. But yet um, Voldemort in, in his early years, you know, when he was Tom Riddle and 
when he was learning about him, when we see that little scene in Chamber of Secrets and also in Half-Blood Prince, I think it is, we see he's got an interesting relationship with the instinct for inquisitiveness, um, but it's differentiating itself in the shadow. So the inquisitive instinct is, is being combined into the instinct for aggression and power and dominance and all this sort of stuff. And so then it takes a different route. But ultimately... Those both those individual individuals, Dumbledore and Tom Riddle from childhood, could have potentially done done it in a, a positive way, or both done it in a negative way. But it's a differentiation based on the reinforcement over time, and that in turn is based on the uh, prevalence of the instinct inside the individual, and and then you know it just reinforces itself. It's almost like it the archetype kind of reinforces itself. It's weird. And then it pushes through and, and, and gains the either, you could say, the individuation or you could say in my own kind of uh, curated concept, which is negative individuation. Um, and I won't go into the concept of negative individuation here because it's quite a complex concept because how obviously someone who knows Jungian psychology will say, well, Adam, how can someone be negatively individuated? Because surely that just means that that person's got loads of different complexes active, uh, you know, working in the unconscious. And so therefore it wouldn't be individuation per se, but actually in my conception, the, to give you a very basic understanding, the, uh, arch the negative archetype associated with a certain instinct works through the complexes which harmonize and uh, push out the negative behaviors instead of the positive behaviors which then free up psychic energy or mental energy um, to then go into a certain pursuit but the certain pursuit is a negative pursuit rather than a positive but just in the same way as someone goes down a certain instinctual path and then gains a flowering of individuation from that so the negative individu uh, individuated individual from even still having those complexes gains negative individuation based on the actualization of the negative counterpart uh, counterparts of the archetypes in consciousness so then you could say well the dictators and things like that they're almost negative in negatively individuated however within the concept of negative within the concept of individuation there's two points We've got what Jung called natural individuation. And we've got what Jung called individuation. Now, individuation, conscious individuation, that is, is, uh, as I've talked about in a video previously, is like enlightenment. It's like that spiritually awakened status um, and they're, they're conscious of they're, they're self-actualized or rather in the in the updated Abraham Maslow model of the, the triangle, the hierarchy of needs, it would actually be uh, they've um, they're self-transcended um, because that's actually the top of the pyramid. You've got the, the pyramid and then you've got the little ball on the top. In fact, Abraham Maslow never actually constructed it in the form of a pyramid, which is an interesting fact, um, but it was later constructed in the form of a pyramid. But you've got self-transcendence uh, self at the top, so then, of course, you would, uh, you would, you would, you know, relate individuation partially to that. Self-actualization, I believe, is a subset of individuation. Self-transcendence more gains the concept of individuation, although you could say that individuation, in fact, you definitely could say individuation is more expansive than self-transcendence in, in a, um, Abraham Maslow's conception. Um, but certainly it fits within it again. It's like I said at the start, I think I said at the start, that all these things fit within Jungian psychology in a certain way. Um, so anyway, with that being said, um, what was I talking about then? Uh, oh yeah, so you've got the individuation, which is like the which is like enlightenment and, um, and, and that sort of level. But then you've got uh, the natural individuation, um, which I didn't realize Jung had talked about and so I I had already experienced this in my empirical observations right and uh, I was thinking hang on there's something else to individuation there's something different here so I was writing the book and I was terming it mono individuation because what I realized is that what I now know to be natural individuation of course um, what happens is some people get to a level of uh, realization in which their 
in line with the self, but they don't actually realise the self consciously or realise enlightenment or spiritual awakening or whatever you want to call it, realise Tori or Moksha. Um, so there's those individuals who, who don't realise it, but instead are perfectly aligned with the behaviour of a um, individual who has attained enlightenment or spiritual awakening or whatever, um, but yet they're aligned with that in an unconscious way. And so I called it mana individuation because it's they're at the highest expression of the mana personality, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, but they've not attained the realization of the self. But then I learned about nat uh, Jung calling it natural individuation. Um, oh my God, I was so thankful to find that passage as well about natural individuation because I was like, oh my God, yes, that's what I saw. That's what I saw. Oh my God. Anyway, so then obviously from then on, not, then on, uh, not to get into my animus or anything, I thought, well, I'm not going to have an animus battle with Jung and call and just fancily call it a new conception of mono individuation what i'm going to do is i'm just going to call it natural individuation because you know my battle my animus battles with younger were already far too fierce so i didn't need need any of that growing um and this is the subtlety of the animus and the animo as well there's a great little um um little piece where is it now oh it's in the the lost zurich, zurich tapes by young they were on youtube for a while but then we got taken down in which young gives this idea of a woman with a um particularly superior animus and uh, he was talking about how uh, when you've got a woman who has a superior animus they because the animus working in the woman when the animus is unconscious because you remember earlier I talked about how the animus is in the unconscious of the woman so the animus when it's unconscious in the, in the woman and when the animal is unconscious in the man so to say they haven't realized them consciously when that's the case the animus directs the behavior of the woman and the animus takes on the negative traits that actually are positive within the man so in the man the animus can be quite philosophical and considered, etc. But in the woman, when the woman hasn't fully realised her animus and it's quite superior, it comes out as um, a certain kind of intellectual pride and a certain argumentative attitude, not really that philosophical or that considered, quite opinionated. So um, Jung was talking about this idea of, the, of this woman um, who would talk to him about philosophy and she just reels off all of these collective opinions about philosophy because that's again a part of the immature animus, is what I, well what I term the immature animus, which is an animus that is based on collective opinion so it's not drawn from your own opinion of what you've read but it's just basically you read all of these different things and then you just spout it off as in some sort of scholarly pride or you know sort of intellectualism of some regard and so when he was talking to this woman she was reeling off all of this philosophy and she had a very very strong animus but she was unconscious of it and uh, he basically asked her at the end of 30 minutes and he'd almost fallen asleep well what do you think of this what do you think of of um of all of those things you've talked to me about and she didn't she didn't have an opinion on it because she had learned all of these things in this kind of very dominant aggressive animus fashion but she had learned them in a collective way and she had learned them in 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 not a way that is of the mature animus that she would have realized had she had actually introspected and pulled out the animus from her unconscious and was able to actually um, basically take all of these ideas that she's read and then formulate her own opinions based on them and then be more considered and more philosophical and utilize the positive aspects of the animus in such a way. So the animus and the animo and all these different things are um, are of course very 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 fine can go very very fine and in the man the anima when it's unconscious can very very subtly affect moods it's incredibly subtle you have to be you have to tune your awareness so much to be able to understand that so when i'm talking about this idea of me having these animus battles with young um in my conceptions when we talk about scholarly pride or when we talk about uh neologisms uh, that is to say someone creating a new conception or a new word and 
it's kind of done in a way uh, that's just, oh, I'm going to create a new conception or a new word based on this phenomenon. And it's kind of done in quite a, an assertive or opinionated way. Um, we can see the animus in that. So what I found when I was doing Revelations of the Self and I was writing it was I put in loads of these uh, conceptions of these new names for things that I was coming up with. And uh, Marie Louise von Franz talks about how the animus does that. And because Jung was such an expansive personality and such a brilliant man, the animus of any other man generally likes to battle with Jung. And it does so in a very unconscious fashion within the man. And that fashion is to create new concepts based on Jungian concepts that kind of already exist but it's a way of the animus in the man of feeling superior and feeling dominant compared when, when in the presence or when in the shadow of of Jung himself of such an expansive and intellectual mind and so I found that and I was putting in all these little concepts and I was thinking hang on a minute I'm completely unconscious of my own animus here because what I'm doing is I'm trying to put in concepts um, in some sort of very immature, childish fashion, um, in, in a fight, let's say in a, an assertive or fighting, those fight instincts coming through me unconsciously, trying to be as good as someone else, fighting with them. But I was doing it in an intellectual setting and I was doing it in a very unconscious setting that I would type these words and I would create these concepts. But in fact, I'm a totally unconscious of my instincts. I'm totally unconscious of what I'm doing. I'm totally living, absorbed in the animus. And, and that's how these instincts affect you. They affect you in these very, very subtle ways that, that bring out these different things in you. And so the anima, again, works in the mood because the anima in the unconscious of a man, if the, uncon if the man, again, is unconscious of it, it works in the man's moods to be... Um, quite the man's quite funny it's weird when you when you look at a man who is living in his anima uh in, in a way that he's unconscious of he's quite moody he's quite he almost gets a little bit effeminate he gets a little bit oh yeah well that's all right you know all, all that sort of stuff because the anima is an emotional principle and as i said the animus doesn't have as much emotion although there is some emotion certainly within the animus um but the anima going into the man, the man doesn't have, or the, or the animus, the anima going into the animus, doesn't have the same relationship with emotion. So then the man gets a little bit like, uh, oh, a bit moody and all the rest of it. When when he can't necessarily get what he wants or when he can't, um, maybe his wife specifically um, is being a bit off or whatever it may be or he's, he's moaning a bit. Um, then, or maybe, let's say, rather, his wife is living in, in uh, her animus and she's being quite assertive and aggressive and opinionated. And then the man might then go into, I mean, alternatively, the man can go into more of a uh, annoyed and, you know, animacy attitude, but it could he could also go into uh, an anima moody attitude of like, oh, you know, um, oh, why do you have to be like this? And you know, he can go inside himself and get moody like that because that's the anima working in, inside of him, um, and that's and when he's unconscious of that, and when he's not integrated his anima in consciousness, so to speak, he's got a balance between the masculine and feminine principles, as the Taoists say, between the yin and the yang. If he hasn't got that, if he's not become individuated, then these things are always going to happen with him, in him you see. Um, and so the dynamics between man and wife are very interesting to understand with regards to um, the anima and animus and how they interplay because we, we see these subtleties there within them. And of course, once the woman and once the man have got that balance, they'll be able to um, be more well-rounded and they won't be taken over as much by these kind of uh, moods and stuff of the other, of the alternative psychic structure that is left in the, in the back of the unconscious. And funny, we should mention about how I have these animus battles with Jung. Psychic structures, I don't know whether that's actually a Jungian conception or whether I, that's one of my neologisms in which I'm trying to have a, an animus battle with Jung by calling it something different. So when I, when I say the psychic structures, I mean the anima, animus, uh, shadow, 
ego, things like that. Um, but anyway, I have actually got a lecture to go to. I didn't know where, I, I thought this would be quite a long video, to be honest. I've got a lecture to go to in about seven minutes. So I'm going to have to go for that. And it's five coming up to five o'clock. I'll get my tea and then we'll get back on. I'll write down a few more things of where we need to go with this video. And, um, and then we will wrap it up. Now, I know I've not concentrated on the ego. I think what we should do now is round it off with the ego so the ego in in Jungian psychology you'll be very aware of what the ego is uh, as, a, as a psychological concept because it's it's one of the things that practically everyone knows it isn't ego as in uh, oh you've got an ego on you it isn't that in Jungian psychology the ego simply represents conscious awareness so my awareness right now and the archetypes come up into my conscious awareness and direct my behavior like that that's so the, the ego in in Jungian psychology it's simply conscious awareness and we also have um unconscious perceptions uh sort of within the ego but also sort of slightly outside the ego so what i mean by this Jung talked about it in the um Omnibook magazine interview from 1942 when he was talking about how Hitler was um, a mouthpiece for the collective unconscious, which you may have heard if you if you watch any of Jordan Peterson, you may have heard him talk about that. That's where it's from. Uh, he, he talks in depth about Hitler actually and the German people and the movements of the collective unconscious in a macro uh, level, in a cultural macro level um, within that uh, interview. And it's very interesting. Um, but he also talks about how um, there's these parts of unconsciousness to either the ego or just outside the ego in which, um, and this can be represented on a diagram as well, which I've actually done in Revelations of the Self and Jung did himself in his own psyche diagram. Um, so let's say there's a conversation. This is the example Jung used. There's a conversation going on in the other room. You're I'm doing something on my computer. I'm not really conscious of that conversation going on in the other room, but it's kind of, in a sense, within my ego. It's kind of like just outside my ego, but it's also within my ego because um, it's still there. I'm still hearing it, but I'm just not conscious of it fully. And so I'm typing something, and that goes into the unconscious, and that's an unconscious perception. And, of course, all these unconscious perceptions, they're still there within the, un the unconscious. They're still there as a memory as well, even though you're unconscious of it in your ego, when it happens, they still go within your unconscious. And so that's quite interesting. And there's actually, even just on that one little thing, talking about the unconscious perceptions, there's so much richness that we could talk about, just about how unconscious per perceptions um, can may, may in part go to uh, create little parts of dreams. So when a dream manifests itself, it may be that certain little parts of those dreams were from unconscious perceptions, things that happened in the day that you weren't fully conscious of that then go into dreams. Because don't forget, any unconscious perceptions that you have are in the in unconsciousness that this is very hard to explain but they're in the unconscious of consciousness so they're in the unconscious of consciousness and so they're unconscious to you specifically and so those things are good candidates for actually putting in a, into a dream as something uh, that is then seen once more in a dream to draw attention to yourself to it within a dream because your ego wasn't as uh, drawn to the attention to it in consciousness. Also, things like when you have certain things in the day that prominently hit your ego and that prominently, prominently hit your awareness, but then you tend to dismiss. Like there might be something that just comes in, you might have a conversation with someone and you just maybe don't like something you've said, just subtly. And then you get on with your day and you've kind of just, it's just subtly been, you can't really use the word repressed or suppressed. I mean, you, you might be able to get away with using the word suppressed or lightly suppressed or mildly suppressed. But it's gone into your unconscious and then that might be something that manifests itself in, in a dream. Um, and, and then obviously it, it kind of almost affects the dream landscape in a way. But I mean, there's so much we can talk about, about um, dreaming specifically in Jungian psychology and, and how different behaviours within dreams can then unconsciously go to affect the behaviour of the next day. And then that behaviour the next day goes to unconsciously create the next dream, which then goes to 
unconsciously direct the behavior in an instinctual manner the next day and it's, it's incredible and there's some brilliant research by uh, Dr. Slelterman, um, Dylan Slelterman, I can't pronounce it, S-E-E-L-T-E-R-M-A-N, right, I think, brilliant research into dreams by him who has actually uh, validated scientifically that dreams affect the behavior of an individual the next day in relation to other people and so this is genius advancement in dream psychology because now we know that this happens to dreams so I would say from a Jungian pers perspective turning that into a Jungian perspective we have things this one day that we're unconscious of and certain things that we're conscious of that we both like and don't like all the rest of it and then we have a dream in which the psyche presents those things to our attention to our awareness so that then we can be more balanced again and we can get some more psychic stability and then those individuals in the dream that maybe you had a poor relationship with one day maybe you have a nice dream about them the next day as a psychic balancing factor then the next uh, uh, sorry in that night between the two days then the next day in consciousness you are with that individual and it's been noted by dr Salterman that um basically um you have a either a more positive or more negative relationship with another person depending on whether the dream was positive or negative negative. and he worked this out with regards to uh, sexual partners as well so if you have a, a sexual dream about your partner you're actually going to be more attracted to them the next day and if you if you have an aversive dream with your partner in then you're going to be less attracted to them the next day and that will all unconsciously affect your behavior because most people don't remember the dreams as soon as they wake up so they go right back into the unconscious but that dream the things that have happened in that dream is still affecting your behavior toward that individual because a dream is a memory and a memory is powerful and it affects and it goes to affect your um, understanding of someone and how you view them so even though it's unconscious it still affects your your behavior and so this is brilliant so the next day let's say you have you have this dream that's positive in, in our example from a second second ago you then see the individual in a new light the next day and you might be more amicable with them you might say to them oh you know well you know in in common conversation we say oh well I've slept on it and I, I, I maybe a bit harsh last night but what you don't know is that the instincts and all these different things have been working in a certain way with all the unconscious perceptions, with all of this conscious experience from the previous day of previous days to then balance your psyche within the dream and then to put you in a different state of mind the next day, which may be a bit more am amicable. And then it means that the psyche can balance again slightly, because when we talk about psychic dis uh, disequilibrium, obviously in this particular case it's not really psychic disequilibrium to any sort of extent it's only very very minor little um little nuances to, to the psychic structures and how they're interacting with consciousness and also with the unconscious and with you know with yourself and other people um but obviously real psychic disequilibrium happens in a neurosis or a psychosis but anyway i'm gonna have to go now because it is my lecture time in fact i'm two minutes late but you know isn't it the way uh, you you know I, i'm a rebel i'm a rebel me got that sweet rebel archetype you know the instinct for rivalry but anyway no so i'll i'll come back and uh, we'll do a bit more chat on this later on because there's still bits and bobs that we need to talk about on this hi guys and welcome back so i have done my lecture i have had my tea uh been for a walk and now i thought i would start uh this video again and see uh where we get to so uh, i started the video uh earlier with the idea of uh two versions of the collective unconscious the atheistic version and the spiritual version but i didn't really touch upon the spiritual version so obviously by now uh, you've heard about the instincts, you've heard about the collective nature of experience, shall we say, of what it means to be uh, be human because of all of these uh, shared sort of features of being human, uh, shared biological features of being human, which then produce a collective experience. Um, and that is very much the, the atheistic version of the collective unconscious. Um, it is simply... Uh, a, a collective experience based on all of the same features we, we have. 
and that really from my re- research and from looking into things can't be disputed by by anyone because we know that we know that there's this shared experience this collective experience based on the fact of our similar traits and the, the things that we possess that are the same and that create a consciousness that is of like experience but the dispute really comes in the spiritual version of the, of the collective unconscious um, and the difference between the atheistic version of the collective unconscious and the spiritual version is that the atheistic version doesn't presuppose a hive mind or doesn't presuppose that the collective experience is, uh, is kind of tied together within a... Uh, an unconscious that could so be um, kind of something that binds up all human minds or anything like that. But within the spiritual version, there's an idea called the Unas Mundas. In the traditional idea of, of Jungian psychology, um, the Unas Mundas, it literally translates as one world, um, is essentially a principle which is could be argued is almost in line with the collective unconscious or is slightly transcendent of it and um, it basically can be thought of via the root of the interrelation of cause and effect or um, the interrelation of ecology and things like that and we can start to gain an understanding of what this one world might be because we're all connected up um, into sort of this one world based on these connecting principles of of the universe and also things like the fact that the universe is potent uh, basically um solidified light and so we all share um one a oneness of energy in that basically um but more so the collective the, the unas mundas refers uh and and really starts to come into its own as a as an idea within synchronicity now we have to be careful of synchronicity when we're talking about it because these days in the modern world uh, there's quite a bit of dispute on synchronicity so there's certain experiences which could be deemed a causal which means there's no direct causal relationship but there is some meaning between the two causal chains but yet one hasn't produced the other so what i mean by this is let's give a modern example an example that i'm sure a lot of people will have experienced as well so it's quite a good example quite a powerful example because any example we can produce that other people have experienced means that it's a better example for relatability so imagine you're on your phone and uh, you're just doing things on your phone randomly and you just have this thought of uh, buying donuts right you think oh you know i'd quite like some donuts and you click on instagram a few seconds later and you're scrolling down and you randomly see an ad for for donuts you'd, you'd not seen this ad previously at the night or anything like that but you see that ad about 10 20 seconds after you've just had the thought about donuts now you've not said anything out loud about donuts so this i conspiracy theory idea of oh well the phones can know what we're talking about and therefore they've placed the ad of donuts there therefore it infers a causal relationship that's all out so there isn't a causal relationship it's simply as most people would term coincidence so very well could be because the main dispute with synchronicity is the fact that because there's so many individuals in the world and therefore because there's so many experiences that all of those individuals are having the probability of anything like that experience occurring is actually a lot higher than you may think therefore the probability of it being coincidence is a lot higher than you think but we can see there is a potentially an a causal relationship based on subjective meaning i in this case the subjective meaning of buying donuts uh, they are placed there now if it wasn't coincidence and if uh, it was 
it was occurring at a higher probability than chance would allow, then there must be something that places these two causal chains in that specific location at that specific time, which means that there is an unas mundas, a one world that um, can orient these things, can orient the, the world into these patterns that then produce that uh, subjective meaning at that time. Now, the best examples we can call upon are dream examples for this, um, because the dream is totally disconnected to uh, any idea of, well, there could have been some unconscious perception that you've had that meant that, obviously, that occurred or whatever it may be. Um, for example, I'll give, I'll give you a good example of a synchronous experience of my own that may just simply be a, a coincidence based on causality with regards to unconscious perceptions. So one day, I, uh, uh, I would do, go in about my business, da 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 da, and uh, I got in bed and I had a dream. And I had a dream of someone eating a uh, smoked salmon sort of um, like sandwich basically, it was sort of like a smoked salmon sandwich, smoked salmon bun type thing and I had, uh, within the dream um, it was getting bought and then someone was eating it after they bought it. The next day I woke up and I come down and I come down to the kitchen and my dad's in there and I'm sat, in, sat down you know just chatting all the rest of it for a little bit and he ends up getting a smoked salmon uh, sort of sandwich or bun which looked exactly similar to the one in the dream and I thought bloody hell that's weird but then I think to myself well hang on a minute I was unconsciously aware even if I wasn't fully conscious of it I was unconsciously aware there was smoked salmon in the fridge because I had been in the fridge, I would used my eyes, I've seen what's in the fridge, and even if I hadn't consciously picked up on the fact there was smoked salmon in there, the unconscious perceptions that I talked about that were in, kind of slightly aside from my ego or within my ego at that time would have picked up on it. And also I would have known that there would have been bread or a bun in the, uh, the, the bread bin. And obviously, then, I've got the experience, the sense experience, to produce the dream that would then show that bagel in the dream, and then it would simply, the next day, my dad just produced it, and then I saw it, and therefore that's coincidence, synchronicity is out, it's not an option. Now, here's another synchronous experience, again, from my own experience, and I'll, then I'll give one from uh, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz. Now I had, and this was, and this was really weird because this was a night before the the, the sam, smoked salmon bagel thing or smoked salmon uh, sandwich thing. So about a night before that, I have a dream and I'm I'm eating pepperoni pizza. I in the dream. The next morning, without me telling my dream to my dad, my mum, because why would I bother doing that? I don't really do that, so I didn't say anything. But my dad says. Do you want to get a pizza on Friday? And uh, I say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get a pizza. And I thought, hey, that's that's synchronous. That's weird because um, I hadn't said anything about pizza the night before. I hadn't said, told them the dream before they had said it. My dad just said it randomly. Um, and then on Friday night, Friday night comes around. I myself got a margarita pizza. My dad had happened to order a pepperoni, and he says to me would you like a slice? And then obviously I get a slice. And so I ate a piece of pepperoni pizza. And uh, it was two days after the dream. And so the dream came into reality. And we could say that was partially synchronous. Now I'm not going to stand here. Well, no, I'm not going to sit here. I always do that. I'm not going to sit here and say, and I argue the case for synchronicity like some sort of madman saying this is exactly right synchronicity is right that was exactly a synchronous experience look it may have just been coincidence it very well could have just been coincidence Marie Louise von Franz has an example of she had a client who was a woman and this woman didn't really believe in um, synchronicity or the power of the psyche, let's say, as 
uh, as an entity that is uh, transcendent and within like this sort of unas mundas. So anyway, this woman has a dream and she gets presented with a set of numbers, a fairly long set of numbers in the dream. And she knows that these these numbers are important, they mean something in the dream. And the next day, she goes in the newspaper, and on the new, in the newspaper, those exact numbers are in the newspaper, and a, a plane has just crashed with those numbers. Uh, that must have been the, uh, some sort of numerical system that was tied to that aeroplane, or something like that, anyway. But that's the story. And... Uh, so that is the the probability the chance on that is extremely extremely low it, it would be a synchronous experience now another example from uh terence mckenna's brother and i'm going to get his name wrong now i think it's dennis mckenna but i'm not 100 percent sure on that but he was on the joe rogan podcast and he talks about how he has this trip on magic mushrooms. And uh, he has this dream. And in the dream, there's hundreds of cattle lay dead in a field. And uh, it turns out that he has to go, this is after the dream of course, a week or so after. He has to go up to his cabin because there's floods happening. So he goes up to the cabin. And he needs to get his, his research work. His research work is left in the cabin. And so he goes to the cabin and he gets his research work. And he can't get back um, for, because the roads were just crazy bad at that, at that point uh, with traffic and all the rest of it. So he has to wait up there a few days. And he's coming back. And um, by this point, of course, the weather's changed and all the rest of it. And he's coming back through uh, this road. And there, in the field next to him, are uh, loads of dead cattle. I can't remember whether it was from the floods or whether it was from something else. I'm assuming it was from the floods. I'd have to watch the, the uh, clip video again from Joe Rogan. But, I mean, if you type it in, um, Dennis McKenna... Um, exp I don't know, I, I don't know actually what it's called, the, the clip. Maybe type in Dennis McKenna... Um, weird experience no experiences of the multiverse that's it dennis mckenna multiverse experience something like that type that in and you'll get up the video and you can hear the full story because he goes into a lot of depth and um so he of course terms that the multiverse in his eyes that was made possibly an experience of the multiverse in my eyes and from a Jungian perspective that would be synchronicity um and the meaning on that is so strong he had the vision which were hundreds of dead cattle, and then he actually saw loads of dead cattle in the field. The meaning that aligns up to that is so powerful, the subjective meaning, that coincidence almost fails in that situation. It's so powerful that, that it can't be a coincidence. And so then we would say, well, that's the Unas Mundas, the thing that orients these causal chains to become in alignment with one another thus giving that subjective meaning now why does this happen why why does let's say the universe or why does this unas mundas do such a thing why would it do so? Let, let's just play devil's advocate and say synchronicity is true synchronicity is is right why would it do such a thing um that's a very very good question and it's a question that is very very hard to answer we could say it's simply the nature of this transcendent system or this transcendent whole of the universe of, of which it, it, it's simply just part of how it works, how it operates and it need not be questioned necessarily because we don't really question particularly how a computer works when we're running a computer, we just work it. And so therefore, you know, it just might be the way it happens. It might be the, the, the way it, it, it works. Does it happen to provide people with meaning to understand some sort of development within themselves spiritually or um, 
or within their personality, within their realization of the self or of the whole in a Jungian conception. For example, if they are to understand a synchronous experience, maybe that gives them an idea of um, uh, the reality of a transcendent self that then allows them to, to realize a part of that and to realize some sort of spiritual dimension of existence that then um, increases their uh, enjoyment of that existence and therefore it would serve the purpose from the viewpoint of the whole or of the universe to um, get someone to a certain level of development which is more in line with that whole or with that self which is the ultimate goal of the microcosm uh, when we think about the microcosm trying to always get back to the macrocosm the the individual trying to always get back to the self um, it's possible that that's the case and there's probably many other different arguments that we could make for the case of synchronicity but let's look at this unas mundas in the spiritual conception of the collective unconscious so let's just go with this idea that it's this kind of hive mind in a sense um that obviously um binds humanity together and uh influences it in certain ways and all the rest of it and then we can say well certain instinctual phenomena um can almost be within the collective unconscious and within the collective consciousness and the collective unconscious can work in certain ways so to influence uh, the movements over cultural movements and also uh, movements within the world over generations and so we may have certain archetypal themes collective uh, cultural archetypal themes playing out as a mythological motif over generations uh, between a uh, within some sort of macro psychology rather than just a micro individualistic psychology um, and we can for some reason for, for some uh, partially we can talk about this in an atheistic setting because you can still see how even if we're removing this idea of the unas mundas, we can see how the groupings of people in collectives, such as society, can almost make this happen anyway. And the collective unconscious, uh, the the unconscious of each individual, kind of binds into a whole unity of a society, which then, um, through crowd psychology and crowd mentality, ends up pushing it pushing that society in a certain direction uh, based on a certain instinct or a certain grouping of instincts over generations anyway so whichever way you look at it you can still uh, see this kind of idea of collective macro cultural psychology and um that moving forward i mean it's it's a branch of cross cultural psychology really but it's a it's a more transcendent version of that um so therefore, we could maybe see progressing in uh, history certain patterns and certain things, uh, ways of experience and all the rest of it and changes within the unconscious, but uh, within different uh, countries and even from a global perspective. And we can see that flower out like that. So that's kind of the idea of the, UNAS, the spiritual side of it. It's more of a kind of a hive mind in a sense. Um, uh, of which things can be molded and shaped and go in different directions and all the rest of it. Um, although, I, I do have to say, I don't 100% think that Jung may have thought of it as I think of it as the hive mind. I think that maybe he was a bit more reserved with his thinking about it and he was maybe a little bit more conservative maybe thought a little bit more like the atheistic viewpoint, but you can certainly infer the hive mind idea from the collective unconscious in a spiritual dimension. Um, it's certainly a, a natural uh, product of thinking about it in a certain way, in that, in that particular way. But no, so, so there's a few different ideas of, of Jungian psychology in terms of, uh, you know, synchronicity and also the, the idea of the collective unconscious as 
both a hive mind and also both simply kind of a collective experience in an atheistic point of view. So I think we should go on to the next one now. So let's talk about the mana personality. And I'm also going to talk about the self at the same time as this. So let's just recap on some of these things in a very, very brief setting to gain some sort of whole understanding of the psyche of the individual in Jungian psychology. What the psyche of the individual looks like in Jungian psychology. So you have the ego, you have the animo and the animus, and you have the shadow, um, you have the self, you have the minor personality, and you have the archetypes, and you have the personal unconscious, collective unconscious. In the collective unconscious, that's where the animo, animus, archetype, shadow, that sort of stuff reign. You've got your personal unconscious, where the co complexes are your personal complexes with various different things maybe you have hypochondria me, you know medical complex or something like that or maybe you have a mother complex or maybe you have this complex or that complex whatever something like that that's in the personal unconscious and of course you have the ego and then you have the unconscious perceptions that are kind of either side of the ego so what is the goal of Jungian psychology? What you know, I've talked about individuation a little bit. I've talked about a you know a little bit about these psychic structures and what they do and how they are and what how they operate and things like that. But I've not really talked about the goal or the uniting factor in Jungian psychology. So imagine you've got this psyche, you've got this psyche diagram, and you've got the anima, animus, self, mana personality, shadow ego and also you've got the persona which i'll touch upon in a minute which is a very very easy concept really to to get your head around it's a little bit more in detail than um some people give credit for uh but we'll we'll just go over it in a basic way i think today the persona and maybe in another video i'll go into it in a little bit more depth because actually there's a little bit more depth to the persona than a lot of people realize it's not simply just uh either uh, an idealized version of yourself or on the flip side to that a cultural role that you adopt um, there's even kind of um, elements of the persona that are slightly unconscious to you elements of the persona obviously that relate to the anima um, and also elements of the persona that um, relate therefore to the instincts for um, certainly for flight and that flight instinct but also um, certain preservation instincts as well that relate to the persona so um we've got these different different structures so the goal is you've got your ego here and you've got a certain awareness and you've got in the unconscious you've got these complexes so what you want to do is you want to go into your dreams and you want to see first off what these complexes are trying to pull out some understanding from the unconscious some unconscious contents as they're called in Jungian psychology and see what these complexes are and see how how they're operating within your psyche and within your conscious behavior then you want to start to think right well I need to get through these complexes, I need to try and change my behaviour in the direction of being able to get rid of these complexes or dissolve these complexes as I like to term it. Um, and certain of these complexes will be tied to archetypes. So my mother complex, of course, um, can be tied to archetypes such as the child, the, the terrible mother, which is the, the negative aspect of the mother. Uh, it can also be tied to the hero as well, the hero archetype. So you've got those things and you kind of maybe can understand from your dreams and from interpreting your dreams for a while. Maybe let's say you've had dreams of your mother coming to you in certain in a certain manner and maybe you've had dreams of um, heroic pursuits of um, maybe trying to kill some sort of uh, wild animal-like figure and that again could be a representation of the mother. Um, more than likely you may have some dreams uh, around sort of terrible mother-like figures within mythology um, if you're kind of bridging on to the collective unconscious with some of your dreams as well specifically if you're having more archetypal dreams uh, even 
the personal unconscious as a subset of that archetypal dream it may be that the particular mythological theme for example medusa which is a terrible mother-like figure that may also represent the personal unconscious complex of the mother complex uh, and so you might have a dream about some sort of hero trying to kill medusa or something and that may represent a dream to do with the mother complex it's just a simple example for uh, just there uh, and so then you can take from that, well, hang on a minute, it, maybe it's not that the hero actually succeeds and kills Medusa, but actually that Medusa turns the hero to stone. Now, what that would represent is the fact that the terrible mother archetype, the, the negative side of the maternal instincts that have been overdeveloped through childhood experiences and that are bound to the child as well, um, because obviously the child responds to the maternal instincts in the mother, even if the child is 18, 20, 30, whatever it is, it, we don't need to be a child anymore to have a mother complex. Um, but that may mean that obviously the, the negative um, part of the maternal instincts is freezing the hero archetype in the child and so they remain childish and they're, they're, they're in this loop of, of being dominated by the complex and not being able to get out there into life experience life because their hero archetype is bound in their in the collective unconscious by um the archetype by the um complex so therefore you have to go into your dreams see that this is the case and then try and slowly push against it and it is a very ego kind of conscious awareness of it and just trying to behaviorally adapt yourself let's say to move forward and gain more association with the hero archetype rather than the child and you do this over enough time and you maybe get pushed back again and maybe you fail at this and maybe you end up not being able to get away from the parents get away from the mother or whatever it may be and you you have times where you're down you have times where you don't feel as if um you feel as if that hero archetype may be impeded within you and you push back and you push back and all the rest of it and what happens over time through the dreams and in the psyche unconsciously is that within your consciousness if you're doing these things surrounding actually pushing out of it then the unconscious is balancing you at the same time and it's pushing you out of that and it's moving away any reinforcement of a child archetype and it's replacing that with the reinforcement of the hero archetype at first which is very very weak and then later on which is very very strong and cemented in your personality in your consciousness because at first the child archetype is so prevalent in the mother complex that any attempt to try and get out of it just ends up in failure and you just keep going back because you're reinforced into that child for so many years whereas so uh, you know after a year or so of doing that the hero archetype's more in your consciousness and then you can get over that that terrible mother archetype and that you can get over the possession uh by the negative arc the negative instincts within within the mother uh, and then move move forward with your life now of course there is an unconscious element to this of which a lot of this can happen unconsciously not necessarily in the case of just someone interpreting their dreams but certain things can happen within the psyche which are very very weird that if let's say a complex isn't incredibly severe the psyche can produce dreams and you don't need to interpret your dreams or anything like that but the psyche can produce dreams that slowly reinforce a new behavior in your consciousness without you realizing that it's a product of the psyche um, and then it directs your behavior in a slightly different direction ultimately getting you over the complex unconsciously now that only happens when a concept complex is mild from what i can observe when a complex is severe it ultimately has to end up in consciousness so for example what i mean by that is that you have to consciously become aware of the complex before you can start to get over it in any sort of way like that but when it's mild it seems that the psyche has this um, way of being able to reinforce behavior and even when um, it isn't mild 
what the psyche does is it through circambulation is it helps you along and it helps you move forward to get to that goal or get to that um newfound archetype that was actually um the reverse of the archetype that was previously in consciousness for you and this idea gets within the the, the idea of the enantiodromia and this is where uh, an uh, I've talked about this before in another video where an unconscious position gets built up a counter position gets built up in the unconscious and so let's say that you've got this association from childhood with the child archetype that's bound to the, the negative instincts of the mother then you've got the hero archetype in your unconscious and it wants to get expression because your life is moving forward you're getting older physiologically um, and obviously instinctually you're getting into new stages of life that require different archetypes to come into presence to be able for you to flourish as an individual and ultimately get to some level of natural or uh, natural individuation or conscious individuation um, so that archetype wants to be freed from that complex so what's happening is the instinct is building up a counter position in the unconscious quite unconsciously to you and it's trying to bestow that in consciousness so that then when you can realize that in consciousness um, and then you can your behavior can kind of change because of that you can then get over the complex and then the new position the counter position that was previously in the unconscious um, that was basically a balancing factor to to the negative potentially the negative um, position that was in consciousness that can flip into consciousness and then it can it means that when you're at a certain stage of life you can be where you need to be and that is a direct product of the psyche working autonomously without your control to actually just naturally uh, get you out of certain things and get you into the correct mode of being it's an instinctual compulsion it's an instinctual drive that allows your psyche to uh, gain equilibrium from the disequilibrium that you previously had so then we've talked a little bit about these complexes and about the ability for the psyche to be able to get over these complexes but also the ability of the psyche to make conscious um, certain elements and certain un previously unconscious contents so that then um, ultimately you can work through the, con the complexes and get out of any neurosis that potentially may be present. Now of course um, in the interpretation of dreams and being able to unpack these complexes at the same time you're getting uh, more of awareness of the psychic structures of anima, animus, shadow, all that sort of stuff and so you're able to become more integrated with those now Jung said that individuation begins with a crisis so something like a neurosis when a ne neurosis you see a neurosis can lie unconscious for a long time it's what I call an unconscious neurosis and um, it's where you aren't aware fully of the neurosis it doesn't come out necessarily incredibly physiologically only maybe subtly uh, physiologically it comes out but then you'll have an experience one day that really pronounces the neurosis uh, it aggravates it and it comes out more physiologically in the typical fashion of heart palpitations sweating uh, you know all the typical signs of anxiety um, even like numbness and stuff in your limbs you can sometimes feel that um, there's, there, literally there is tons and tons of different um, sort of physiological psychophysiological phenomenon um, in which or phenomena which uh, are directly related to psychological um, aspects and things within your psyche rather than anything at all physiologically that's wrong there's nothing wrong physiologically at all um it's simply the case that it's all it's all in your psyche um and people can get into states of um certain parts of their body randomly hurting 
for some reason again nothing physiologically wrong but they may have some pain in their wrist or they may have some pain in their neck or they may feel as if they can't breathe sometimes and maybe not just in the case of a panic attack but just generally they feel maybe feel can't they breathe there um they have all these weird odd random pains that aren't anything but really from a from a physiological point of view uh they're nothing bad at all but yet they're they're present they're there um and so of course this is where the neurosis comes out prevalent and that's the crisis and so at that point obviously if the neurosis is prevalent like that therapy needs to be uh, sought out and then obviously you need to um go through your dreams you need to go into yourself you need to inter introspect pull out that information the complexes pull out those unconscious uh, contents that you need to be aware of to be able to understand some sort of direction with regards to getting out of it what will then happen is of course it starts i mean even prior to this it's already been started unconsciously but circambulation will start which is that going back and forth back and forth on yourself around here back and forth until you get to the ultimate aim of let's say the self which is a totality of your personality um, and so you'll go back and forth and you obviously we can very much define this in panic attack terms so for example when you first try to when you first have that neurosis when it comes out prevalently and consciously uh, then you're going to just try to get out of it but it's, it's not going to work you're just going to be pushed back pushed back pushed back but then you might get a little bit further you'll maybe start looking into yourself a little bit but then you'll be pushed back again and this is all this kind of circambulation happening then you'll go inside yourself and you may introspect you may get therapy and then obviously you can start to work with the psychic structures in your dreams and unpack those com complexes and then you're going to get a little bit closer to the self but then you're going to go back on yourself again because things don't work out and you go go back a little bit you take a step back and you work for other issues that you may find that you have when you're obviously working on this other one but now you've realized there's other things that you need to work on as well and so you're going back and forth back and forth until slowly over a long period of time the the kind of psychophysiological phenomenon uh, that occur because of the anxiety and because of the panic disorder which is directly related to complexes in your unconscious once that uh, those complexes slowly get dissolved over time because of the therapy and the dream work and all the rest of it then you're obviously going to be uh, in a position where you're you're getting a uh, closer association with the entiodromian um uh positions that are built up in your consciousness and men are now more balanced in your unconscious since the complexes have worked through been worked through um then you don't have the panic attacks anymore and then you're you're more balanced and you realize that you've got a higher level of integration with the other psychic structures because it was the things within those archetypes and those psychic structures that were bound up and that were giving you uh, that were tied to the complexes so therefore when you get rid of the complexes you integrate your psychic structures as well simultaneously um and then therefore you get close to individuation hence why Jung said individuation starts with a crisis because it's the crisis that makes you conscious it's the consciousness that gives you the ability to in introspect and properly introspect then it's the introspection that then leads to the dissolving of complexes and then therefore the um, unbinding or unconstellating of archetypes that can then be beneficial to you and that can be more integrated into a whole personality and it's once the complexes are fully dissolved that then you get access fully to that mana personality uh, which comes through uh, psychologically in a perception of um, a certain archetypal figure or archetypal form for example for myself i have quite an association with a mana figure of sort of it, it well it's best represented by my granddad actually i feel as if i am it's a weird i know it's a weird thing to say but it feels as if i am my granddad in a way or there's part of my granddad within me 
but in a very strong and solidified way, not in like a, a very weak way. Um, and that relates to, uh, 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 oh, I can never pronounce this, Maui, I think it's Maui, M-A-O-R-I or M-O-A-R-I, the New Zealand tradition anyway, mythology and, and religion. And um, there's a concept called mana in that, which is like some sort of transmitted magical power through generations. Now, it relates almost to, in a modern scientific uh, speech, to the genetic closeness of, obviously, a son or a daughter to their parents. And it's within that genetic, it's within those genetics, those I would as well say those instinctual similarities to your parents, that the piece of mana lives that then is activated within uh, the attainment of the mana personality. So you could also talk about it in scientific terms, there's no need to be mystical necessarily about this. Um, and so when that's activated, then you get the mana personality. Now for me, I've always seen my granddad as more of a masculine father figure than my actual dad. So it's natural that obviously when I got that, those ideas of Amana uh, and got those kind of perceptions of what I consider Amana, that I would have that association with my granddad, not necessarily my dad. So, uh, and also since my granddad is naturally individuated, um, he's not consciously individuated, but he's naturally individuated, I also saw that within him, so therefore it was natural for me to spontaneously have that mana figure arise for me um, because of that association. Whereas my dad isn't naturally individuated, although he's getting there, he's not too far off. Um, I think given another five, six years, he probably will be there. Um, but it, it's just, there's, his animo, it's, st it's still a little bit, you know, possessed by certain ideas in his animo and things like that. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but there is things like that w within him. Um, but anyway, so, um, therefore you then get that, that attainment of, uh, the mana personality, which is the best expression of your personality as cemented and grounded in a specific career or specific group of, of subjects that you're known for within society and you're rooted as a tree within society and you are um you are an individual in your own right and you are within a certain level of wholeness i always draw the um parallel and i don't know whether young drew this parallel as well actually i'm not certain but i always draw the parallel as like a flower when you're blossoming out and so if you're if you're individuated you're blossomed out as a flower um and you've got that access to the mana personality you've got a ba an individualized balance between the anima animus all the all these different things within your psyche and um they are integrated into a whole unit um and you can see that the, you see there's no point in me trying to explain this because it's so it can be quite complex to explain but you can see this in people um in the world where where there's mono individuated people and and individuated people um and that they actually have this kind of air about them of which they are very grounded and cemented in their own personality and you know you can see within them it's an empirical observation that they are um just they know who they are they, they're, they're comfortable with all the different things within themselves um and so they are individuated as such they are flowered out they are grown into uh society they are rooted in society like a big oak tree as i've said previously and uh so um, and that is that is the goal of Jungian psychology and you get there through either well in natural individuation through just unconsciously going through life and your psyche integrating itself through your experiences without you even being fully aware of it or you get there through dream interpretation introspection maybe psychological understanding as well in other dimensions which then integrates your psychic structures 
quicker because you're conscious about it and then you can get to individuation that way um i think there is a lot of uh intelligence that comes into it as well so i think intelligence comes into the concept of individual individuation um if you're more intelligent then you're likely to get to individuation not only in your lifespan because some people don't actually attain individuation in their lifespan um you can see actually quite a lot of old people who just don't they're not individuated they've got disassociations with certain things and stuff but um there are those individuals who you know who are more intelligent who actually end up attaining individ individuation faster or attaining it um obviously just at some point during their lifespan other than those who don't attain it um so therefore you know there, there is that as well um although saying that the intelligence can't come into it fully because there are some people who are very intelligent but who only end up ever realizing natural individuation not um conscious individuation in the fact of enlightenment or something like that um although most in, a, a lot of intelligent people um will obviously understand that uh, sorry conscious individuation so um i also wanted to touch on the fact that you've just read me a little prompt there um natural individuation can also be considered as more than enlightenment uh, and what i mean by that is that or rather, I shouldn't say more than enlightenment, but more than spiritual awakening. That's the correct term. You can become spiritually awakened and still have complexes. You doesn't spiritual awakening isn't dependent on you not having complexes. You can become spiritually awakened and still have complexes after being spiritually awakened. So, na conscious individuation doesn't mean just becoming spiritually awakened becoming self transcended or whatever you want to call it it's not it's not that it means more than that it means conscious individuation means yes being spiritually awakened you know attaining satori or moksha or whatever you want to call it but also getting past all your complexes you see what we could do is we could separate as most people do enlightenment and spiritual awakening we could say spiritual awakening is here enlightenment is here and in spiritual awakening you may still have some complexes after it in enlightenment you have very very few if not any complexes right so um really we we should say enlightenment isn't possible in in ephemeral existence it isn't possible if you are a living being um that's probably a better terminology of it but enlightenment is like here sorry not enlightenment individuation is like here it's it's more than spiritual awakening it's not just you become spiritually awakened and then you're individuated it doesn't work like that because you still have complexes you still have things to work through in your unconscious to be able to get you to individuation but then once you're to individuation it's like the the highest expression of enlightenment in an individual without the individual just literally being dead because death could be considered the ultimate enlightenment essentially and it's been talked about by some sort of spiritual sages and gurus in the past that you have to be dead to be enlightened and it's a very interesting idea because death is the ultimate bliss there is no uh, there is no ephemeral existence to bind you to anything so therefore it's the the ultimate attainment of, of enlightenment or nirvana um but you know in, it's like individuation is the highest point of enlightenment that you can reach expressed in an individual existence that's what it is so it's not just spiritually awaken uh, spiritual awakening or anything like that that's the level of individuation and alongside that it's that highest level of enlightenment that you can get as an individual existence while also being grounded within an individual existence in a society within a specific career so we'd have to take certain people as a, and see the only real person i can think of with this mainly because there's probably other examples but i can't really think at this exact moment but you would say someone like Jordan Peterson because he's spiritually awakened, he's got rid of lots of his complexes, 
and and he's also he still has a societal existence and so he still is rooted firmly as a tree in society uh, and he's he's not abandoned society or anything like that to live on a mountain top which doesn't really get you anywhere to be honest in in, in the long run of things anyway you may as well just kill yourself because it's like what you're doing you know it's like okay so you want to go off into a nirvana like state well why don't you just kill yourself because that's just as good because then then you won't then you then you really be in nerva kalpa simadi to like some sort of really crazy high degree um but no so that's the only example i can really call upon but there's many 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 examples that you could call upon with regards to natural individuation as well with different people in society who have this and there are definitely a lot more cases of individuation conscious individuation that i could call upon but i'd have to have time to go through it and look at all the top people in society and realize oh yeah that's there that there that there that there the other um and so uh, so that's the kind of that's the kind of level that um you you necessarily want to be want to be at um you know it was an argument for nietzsche and of course jung himself indiv- you know obviously he was individuated he came up with a bloody concept of individuation um in fact i've made a case in revelations of the self because i have i've got a, a new concept of individuation that i've sprung from uh, different concepts of nietzsche's and different concepts of jung jung's and i've made a case that jung was actually not only individuated but on this other level of conception that i've made based on individuation as a phenomenon um and and i think that's actually quite correct so let me just uh, talk about one or two more things before we uh kind of get into actually yeah after that we need to get into um certain experiential uh things within the uh archetypes and that's a very very important thing so stick around till the end to to listen to that because that is that's the core of empirical understanding within jungian psychology so let's talk about the animal of the animus getting pulled from the unconscious so jung talks about how um the anima or the animus will is the masterpiece so first off you integrate your persona this is how like a normal development would go in fact for my development it's quite funny because the persona is the last thing i'm working on at the moment well i say it's the last thing i've got a little bit of uh, to do with the animus as well the animus and the persona for me um and that was because i was socialized into the anima you see so because the persona is um is related to the anima then of course i was going to have persona issues because of the relation to the anima and other things that happened in my life so um it's the case now that i have to start working on my animus which i'm doing and therefore getting over the persona in the in the process because the animus has no affiliation to the persona because it's a fight instinct rather than the flight instinct having a persona relationship because it fears it it worries about the circumstance of what's going on outside and that in itself is an idealized sense of self that is to be found within the persona um or a sort of a way of how you should behave uh, so that's why we consider the, the flight instincts as the anima and the fight instincts the animus as well um but yeah so um I forgot what I was talking about. So, yeah, that was it. So, in a normal, healthy development, persona is integrated first, the idealized sense of self, the, the cultural uh, role that you put on and that you integrate with yourself um, and, and that actually becomes unconscious and a part of your personality. That's something that we can all integrate quite quickly. Once we get jobs and once we're grounded in society, the persona is quite easily integrated in a healthy development because it, it it's just it just becomes something that you naturally um kind of have within you it's a part of your personality that you ser- uh, you display a certain behavior in a certain situation and so it just becomes a natural thing that it doesn't isn't disintegrated from your personality but then you work on the shadow and you work on integrating your shadow and bringing more of that to consciousness and then getting a, a, a balance within consciousness and unconsciousness between w- with your shadow. And this comes up for a lot in honesty. And I noticed this in myself, actually, when I was starting to integrate with my shadow. 
before integration with your shadow, you hold back. You're a persona. What I mean by that is you are someone who says the right thing that people want you to say. Because, oh, it's easier because I'll say the right thing and then it means that I don't have to get into this thing or maybe even start an argument or whatever it may be. And you're a persona and you conform like that. You're high in trait agreeableness, let's say. Because the persona is something that's agreeable. It, it directly correlates with agree trait agreeableness. But when you integrate your shadow, when you start to integrate your shadow, you get harmonized in consciousness and unconsciousness by the fact of you're honest. And you start to, anything that comes to mind, if you don't like something, you just say it. You just, you know, you just like, Bleh. you know, but I'm just going to say it. I'm not going to, obviously there's times in which you think, well, I best not say this. And so you don't say it. And that and that's by the by really it doesn't matter it's not any sense of disintegration or anything like that it's simply just a, a an act of will that is that is correct in the moment but of course if you feel like there's something that you want to say and that you know you're not going to be a persona you're not going to be like oh well i'm not going to say it because it you know uh, i don't know if this might start an argument with someone you just end up saying it just saying how you feel, what it, what it is, you know, what it is you don't like, or whatever. There might be a show, for example. Uh, this is a very, very basic example. You know, I don't know why I'm saying this example. It's, it's the most basic example ever. But, you know, there's a show you don't like. You sat around with five or six other people. And you're like, oh, this is crap. This is just bloody ridiculous, or whatever. And you're just like that. Whereas someone who's quite a persona won't say that. They'll, they'll be like, oh, oh. if someone even asks them, say oh are you enjoying it and then they say oh yeah 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 it's, it's really good yeah and they're bottling up all of that shadow they've not got integration there you see but you know if you're like you're watching bloody star wars and you just don't like i love star wars by the way but let's do taking it for now you know uh you, you you think oh no this is crap although saying that i don't like the uh, phantom menace but you know, where everyone doesn't like the Phantom Menace, Jesus. I don't know, I don't even met anyone who bloody likes the Phantom Menace. But, uh, you know what, favourite one is, um, Return of the Jedi. The, the, uh, fifth, is it fifth? Fifth one, I think. Um, but no, they'll say that, so they're a persona, you see. But then you, you start to flip that on its head when you start to gain more integration with the Shadow. Now, um, after that is the opposite psychic structure that's in your unconscious. You're a man, let's say you're a man. Your animus is in consciousness, so it's the integration of the anima. Now, this is the, the thing. I need to despiritualize this over the next 20 minutes. Because Jung talks about this process in a very, very spiritual way, very, very mystical way. And it really is not a good way of talking about it at all. He's really bloody pissed up the war with the way, he, like, honestly, he has. The way he talks about his integration with the, con the, the unconscious psychic structure is just terrible communication. So he's talking about how it, like, you know, it, it come, it's bestowed out of this unconscious realm and the anim anima comes out in this certain way and uh, it comes into consciousness. Now, I was thinking because of him being so poetic and spiritual about his ideas of this, this anima coming out of the unconscious, that it's kind of, uh, that it is like a spiritual thing, and hang on, I'm like, well, that's not very scientific, or that's not very of an empirical viewpoint, but this is what actually happens. So, it's not that it comes out of the unconscious, as in the unconscious back here, right? But the instincts of the anima and animus are always working within your behaviour. But the one you're conscious of is the one that aligns with your personality and that you understand the behavior of. And so you're, it's in your consciousness. But what happens is the anima, let's say you're unconscious of the anima, it doesn't come out of the unconscious and then you get to utilize it. It's always present within your behavior or, or in your consciousness uh, in certain words, certain language, certain moods, certain this, certain that. But you just get conscious awareness of the fact that it is already in your behavior. It's coming out as an instinctual force. So, for example, um, I remember when I first saw the Animus, and it was brilliant, 
I realized, hang on, I've always had the animus in my consciousness in this kind of uh, overbearing sense of the animus because I'm still working through the animus so I, I, I still, there's certain aspects of the animus that I still struggle with myself but um, I realized that it was always in my consciousness and I've just been unconscious of the fact that I've been in animus for all this time and it's the same with someone else they'll be unconscious of the fact that they have actually been in anima for most of their life, for, for, for certain part, parts of their daily life, weekly life, monthly life, within their behaviour. And then they realise it and then it comes to consciousness. And that's the point in which you get the ability to utilise it as expressed in your own personality. Now, that of course occurs unconsciously in natural individuation so it naturally gets bestowed over time and slowly the behavior of the individual changes um, so to be more holistic with regards to the psychic structure, structures although they will always be within their in individual personality and they will, they will always let's say subtly favor the psychic structure that they're aligned with biologically so if they're a man they'll align more with the animus but if, but in conscious individuation, this is the brilliant thing. You get bestowed it, and you you know that you've got the anima and the animus. So then you can actually utilize them if you're that hyper conscious of them, um, and you can start to utilize the, the masculine side or the feminine side, and you can utilize all these different things. Now, of course, we all consciously utilize the shadow, and we all consciously utilize the persona. But there's a level of experience of which. The anima and animus are, are harder to attain conscious manipulation of. And so it's very hard to actually get to conscious individu individuation of where you can actually attain conscious, uh, conscious attainment of them. Now, we also need to query the other side of the attainment of the anima and the animus, which is the attainment of the anima and animus within uh, dream figures or within... Uh, figures within active imagination which active imagination in Jungian psychology which I've touched upon in other videos but I'll include here because I'm doing this big long video on Jungian psychology is the it's essentially like souped up daydreaming you don't need to think of it as anything else lie on the bed lie on a chair you you recall some dream images or you just fantasize generally and uh, then these these scenes will become before your eyes and you might talk to figures in your fantasies and things like that and so with the attainment of the animal let's say for if you're a guy the animal will come to you in the fig for me personally it's a fairy the anima comes to me as a fairy-like figure. She she's dressed in white most of the time. She's she's called Aralyn. Uh, basically, what happened was one night I was going to sleep, and just as I was going to sleep, this the unconscious spoke to me because you can get these. You can, you can start to get into a level of awareness where the archetypes, the unconscious figures of the archetypes, the autonomous personalities of the instincts actually talk to you as expressed um, as a sub facet of your own personality when you're starting to get into the state uh, like a meditative state let's say but you can only really do it when you're in a meditative state otherwise you, you don't the voices aren't there the voices or you can't hear the fantasies as like you know right now I can't hear the voices or the fantasies to be in such a state would be to be in a psychosis but when you're in a meditative state you can hear the voices or you can hear the fantasies um, and so this name popped up in the blackness out of the blackness of the unconscious Aralyn and then the next day or the day after when I was doing some vision work uh, she came to me in a, in a vision and that's the, the attainment of the anima as a fairy or as a goddess which is the highest level of attainment of the anima, Sophia, which means wisdom. Um, and so with the animus, it'll be very similar, but it'll just be um, a different figure. Right now, I can't remember what Jung talked about with how the animus comes to consciousness, possibly as a sage or as a philosopher, something like that that the, the woman will see in fantasies and will be able to build up a connection with. And the the development of the animal of the animus to a superior level in fantasy like that 
becomes the intermediary factor, the mediating factor between the unconscious mind and the conscious mind, so then you can balance in wholeness um, the, the, the unconscious and the things that are in the unconscious um, from perceptions and things like that with the conscious mind, which um, obviously can now be aware, uh, has higher awareness of uh, themselves and of the unconscious. And in fact, actually, you build up this remarkably intuitive feeling for your own unconscious. And you can almost understand things without even having dreams or fantasies or visions or anything. You just know the certain aspects within your unconscious. And by that very definition, they aren't unconscious anymore. But you can also intuit it. You can almost intuitively pick up on things where you may be falling or where there may be little deficiencies in the unconscious and so then you can act upon them straight away immediately and that would be in the, uh, the attainment of um, individuation as well and that, that power that you get bestowed is a, is a kind of a product of the, the highest development of the anima or the animus. Now let us go back from fantasy or spiritualism, a little bit of spirituality, um, to the instincts as expressed, the animal and the animus as expressed in subjective experience. So this is where we can see the psycho-instinctual phenomena as empirical fact. And this is what people don't talk about as much in Jungian psychology. So we have something called, in, in Jungian psychology, anima or animus projections. Many people know what a projection is. Psychological projection is where you uh, basically project onto someone else or onto something or some place or whatever, some something within your own psyche. So if you have an, if I were to have an anima projection onto a, onto a woman, then that would mean that I'm projecting the feminine side of my unconscious personality onto uh, the person in the external world, the woman in the external world, which then means that I go chasing that woman externally rather than actually having wholeness of personality in my own psyche and a balancing uh, with that mediating factor, with Aralyn, um, with the uh, anima in my unconscious. Now, um, here's where we get into the actual raw interest with the instincts. So the anima is, I've talked about before, the idea. The anima relates to the idea. The, the animus relates to the rule or the, the logos, the rule from that idea. And it also relates, particularly when we talk about this example, you'll see it, it relates to the spirit, the thing, the get up and go, the thing that actually does something. So how can we view this, in, this compulsion of instincts within subjective experience. Well, I'm going to provide you with an example for myself, and it really doesn't matter whether it's an example for myself or from someone else, it's exactly the same phenomena. It doesn't matter whether it's me having it or whether it's... We could call upon any amount of examples uh, from any amount of experiences, and when I talk about this example, you will automatically understand the um, experience that I'm talking about anyway. So I don't really need to validate it specifically by telling you other experiences of other people. So I have an anima projection on this girl, right? And I have an anima projection on this girl because uh, she's a bit rebellious. And I don't accept inside myself certain rebellious facets of my personality at the time. And I think I've told this story very briefly before. But I don't accept certain things, uh, rebellious things within my psyche at the, the same time. So I project out those things onto her because we often project out uh, the deficiencies on our, in ourself onto another person. So to chase ourself in, in such a manner and to try and attain those deficiencies without really becoming conscious of them in our own self because that would require pain and that would require sacrifice. Instead, it's easier for us to project those things out onto another person and attain them externally in, in the world. So we often have an instinctual compulsion um, uh, from the instincts that are not as integrated within us to project and therefore to um, 
go for a certain type of person. In my case, the rebellious person, so long as I don't accept those instincts within myself and within the totality of my personality. When you accept all the instincts within yourself, when you can get to that level of awareness, you can withdraw all your projections, and then you can simply choose, choose, so to speak, your love. But we can never really say that we choose our love, because the unconscious always remains unconscious, and so therefore there's always certain things working in the unconscious to choose our love for us. So I have an animal projection. Now, I asked this girl, do you want to meet up? And she says, yes. Now, I am I go and make my lunch. And I'm going to make my lunch. Uh, and I, I get my avocados. I get my avocados and my, and my rice. And I'm there eating my avocados and my rice. And I'm eating them quite fast. And of course, in my unconscious, I'm fantasizing. Because I fantasize all the time. God, my, my mind is like the imagery and the... The words and stuff is incredible in my mind. Um, and I fantasize of seeing her on the on the bench where we're meeting outside. And suddenly I'm eating my avocados and my, and my um, rice a little bit faster. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just eating them. And, I'm, and I've become conscious of this. And I think, so what I'm doing here is I'm eating them faster to get to the girl. Obvious, you know, it's like, a, oh, right, so I'm eating this faster, let's go down and let's see the girl, right? And you would say, quite obviously, in just normal speech, well, you know, you, you like that girl, so you're doing that to get to the girl. But there's more to it than that. I mean, that's okay, yeah, that's what exactly what it is. But let's talk about it in a Jungian perspective, because this is where it gets interesting. So the anima projection that I've got on that girl um, is stimulating my animus. The spirit. Remember I told you that the animus is the instinct for fight. And it's the spirit. The thing that is get up and go. Is overbearing. Is powerful. Is the thing that, that really creates life. It's almost a creative force as well. Because it takes an idea and it's got the spirit to create it. Just as in the fight instincts. You have an idea um, for you know a specific uh, situation. In which involves the, the fight instincts. And then you do it and you're wally and you do it so i have this idea this fantasy in my mind of this girl sat on the bench the anima right and it's all within my own psyche as well so what i'm actually doing is i'm not chasing the external girl but i'm chasing the fantasy of the projection onto the external girl which is in fact in my own psyche so therefore i'm chasing a part a part of my personality that is already within myself and that actually i'm being quite foolish because i'm chasing something externally which is already an, a possibility of attainment inside myself so i'm eating these and that fantasy, that idea, that feminine idea is stimulating the masculine animus inside of me. I mean, it's the spirit, so I'm eating, eating faster. And so we've got the idea, the, the tender, tender befriend anima instincts here that are working within me, stimulating the animus within me, um, which is the fight instinct, the spirit. And I'm going out there and I'm getting the girl. Now... I didn't get the girl, by the way. That would have been too good. Right, anyway. So I go into the... Um, next, I go into the bathroom. And I'm doing my stuff. You know, I'm putting my things on. And, and I thought to myself at this point, or I thought maybe a day later after I had this experience, that that direction there of going into the uh, bathroom and doing certain things to myself, you know, deodorant, all that sort of stuff is a very, very subtle expression of the instinct for constructivism, which comes into the archetype of the creator. And it's the creation of myself, it's the uh, beautification of myself, let's say, for, once more, the attainment of the idea of the anima. So therefore, when Jung talks about how the instincts bleed into one another, he also talks about this in an empirical setting of actually everyday experience and how they bleed within one another like that um and that was that was very very interesting now of course we know when we look back in history you look back at uh, the dinosaurs trudon specifically uh trudon would build like a little nest the male would build a little nest for the female and he'd obviously try and attract the female with his little nest now 
the whole idea of, let's say, making your bed or do it tidy in your room quite frantically before a girl comes over. That's the instinct for constructivism based on the animus which is trying to attain the anima, the idea of the anima. And so the instincts are bleeding into one another there. But you're creating, you're constructing the room in a certain way so that then you attain the uh, woman which really is, all all of this is just an interplay of instincts within yourself um, to then try and obviously um, get the woman and obviously procreate and therefore the instincts of the sexual instincts also come into this which is the instincts of the, of the lover and so that bleeds into this as well. So you've got all these things bubbling up and creating this experience and that is why we can validate the Jungian concepts so readily because this is empirically based, this is experientially based. You can see this right now, right here, and everybody, every bloody bugger who doesn't know about Jungian psychology, all these brilliant psychologists who maybe they don't know about Jungian psychology get possessed by these ideas and go off and um, and end up uh, and end up doing these things. And we're all possessed by these ideas for life that um, kind of capture our spirit and then life creates itself. Now, obviously the main two archetypes in the collective unconscious are the anima and the animus, the, the main two, the kind of, the, you know, the uh, fight, flight, the fight, tend and befriend type, type thing. Um, they're all within... Uh, they're, they're kind of the two main archetypes and then obviously you've got the others that kind of uh, are present and that kind of um, are within the psyche and that obviously bleed into the anima and animus in a way and the interplay between them. Um, and it's very, very interesting when we start to see this kind of playing in existence of the anima and the animus and playing of these archetypes in existence and being able to see these walk uh, coming through experience like that um now of course it's very typical of anima possession when let's say you are possessed by certain ideas so for example um there will come a point in which there's a certain level of psychic stability after the conception of psychic puberty uh, which uh, takes a little bit longer than physiological puberty um, and it's a balancing of your psyche through the turmoil of or it's a maturing of your psyche through the turmoil of of youth both the physiological turmoil and then obviously the psychological turmoil that comes alongside that and um, it's this kind of experience in where fantasies are very prevalent, um, all these sort of uh, disequilibrium in the psyche is present. So that then, uh, when, uh, but then when you get older, there becomes a little bit more balance there. But certainly within anima possession, there becomes this compulsion to um, literally you get an idea and you get compelled by it and then you go out and do it. And then you, uh, and it may be for the attainment of a woman, or it may be for the attainment of a certain thing, like it might just be to do with another archetype. For example, you might be possessed by ideas, um, and you might particularly have um, a certain impulsivity that goes along with that. And therefore, what happens is that you'll get this idea and you'll feel compelled to do it. And again, that's kind of within. Uh, an instinctual reaction it may be some sort of um relationship to anima possession of course uh, and it may be as a sub facet of that um but also it might be within um the reinforcement of a particular behavior that aligns with a certain archetype for example i could i could draw one very definite uh, example here of the joker archetype um and so you might have a compulsion to do funny weird random things that you get any idea to do and you you kind of see this in good comedians 
uh, and and I'm not saying that this is necessarily within anima possession, but certainly uh, you can see the possession by the ideas which ultimately are uh, an anima phenomenon within this particular experience of life. Uh, but there's no necessary, there's no psychic disequilibrium here or whatever. But this is just a separate example, really. But you see. Uh, this compulsion when comedians get an idea they immediately go for it and go bold and big and all the rest of it and so that's the the um the kind of the idea the anima and the 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 spirit the the animus taking hold of that idea and going with it and being bold and within that within that kind of interplay lives the joker archetype in that specific scenario um because it's of course running with regards to a comedian and a comedian has their instincts their individualized physiology and their genetics is differentiated uh, for more of the joker archetype and so that comes through and so every experience in life because of their genetic differentiation and the neurological differentiation that comes from that they always feel the need to joke and they always create a joke and it's just that that's the way their mind works that's the way their mind works that's the way their mind works and you know we, we can argue that some of this is socialized but people have this from a very very young age you can see little kids with um uh, with this weird propensity to make jokes and we're always making jokes and so it's it's this differentiation that we've got present that that then flowers o over time and then is is with that and within the instincts of course and you can do this for all different manners you can do this for the sage you know the, the philosopher the psychologist the scientist things like that who have more of a prevalent um archetype of the sage or you could do this for the explorer or whatever it may be the person who uh, obviously has a genetic differentiation for extroversion and possibly has been socialized into a setting which would uh, differentiate themselves for exploring the world and so therefore they go off in in that direction um and therefore we could say that there is an element of socialization in in it because the socialization, as I talked about, is a superficiality based on uh, the individual setting that they're brought up in. And so it maybe just lends themselves to a certain path slightly, but generally it's the differentiation of the instincts, the instinctual compulsion that makes them be that particular thing. So, for example, I'll give you an example, like, okay, someone may be an explorer if they have that differentiation, and they'll go up and they'll, and they'll be that, but if they have a certain socialization, their expression of that archetype might not be quite as pronounced as someone else who has a other specific socialization, then they might, they might have a different uh, way of that being pronounced, essentially. So, for example, someone might have it uh, that genetic differentiation, and it may go off in a certain way as uh, exploring mountains, you know, Welsh mountains around here. But then another person might have a certain way, and they'll be exploring the entire world. Now, of course, we also have the argument of well, in fact, if the instinctual compulsion is great enough, then surely the socialization won't matter because the individual will have such a compulsion to do such a thing because of their individualized uh, art, their individualized instinct is so prevalent that they will end up doing that anyway and there, there is uh, an argument for that um so yeah you can do this and it's and it's, and it's very interesting as well um and the way in which intelligence comes into this of course there is an intelligence factor in this uh, for example, you would imagine someone's quite intelligent and they also have a specific differentiation for a certain archetype, then we start to see, well, what happens is, let's say the sage archetype, the instinct of curiosity, inquisitiveness, that gets reinforced, 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 but then the intelligence compounds on top of that and then they blossom out that way and uh, they become one of the best of, of society, essentially. Um, because of that differentiation and that um, compulsion with their IQ or their intelligence to seek out new information 
especially if we're to consider that that person is high in trait openness, which is correlated with in intellectual curiosity, which then is also correlated to the archetype of the, of the sage, which then means your your ability to be um, flowered out as someone in, to, in society who is right at the top um, within um, a specific archetypal role and you're a carrier of, of a flame of an archetype, that is obviously going to be quite um, prominent and going to happen. Um, so that's that's very interesting as well. Um, and so, you know, you, you see these kind of, uh, you, you see a, a comp an instinctual individualization, but also when it's paired with intelligence, that's when you get the, the top of society, let's say, those individuals who are, who are at that top. Um, whereas um, if, let's say, um, the instinct isn't quite as strong or the intelligence isn't quite as strong, then those individuals are going to be slightly lower down in society. Um, and so therefore they're going to be sort of on this level here. But in fact, we have, when we're talking about society and when we're talking about different levels of um, meaning within society, we almost have uh, those with uh, a transcendent meaning that is unegoic and that is um, very characteristic of um, individuation, whether that's in its natural or its conscious form. And they're the individuals who are, have transcendent meaning and the, 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 the small number of people who run society. Then you have those uh, other quite weird category of society in which you have transcendent meaning like myself Tra my transcendent meaning would be philosophy uh, I, I would also term transcendent meaning calling as well or in Indian spirituality terms as I've talked about before uh, my swadharma I've got my transcendent meaning but yeah I'm not at the top of society so therefore there's another branch of people who have their transcendent meaning maybe intelligent maybe not that intelligent but they have their transcendent meaning um but they're not necessarily getting the top dollar in terms of money or in terms of status for their transcendent meaning which is a very weird branch of society because they've actually got a very very strong instinctual compulsion for a specific field um and they may have the intelligence to go with that but by what whatever circumstance by just happenstance of causality um that they're, they're not at that top level then you've got let's say those who have semi-transcendent meaning so have got some level of instinctual compulsion for something they go down a specific route that is in line with their instinctual compulsion and they build a career based on that and therefore they've kind of semi-aligned to uh that that transcendent meaning and they they earn a middle amount of money, they earn a middle amount of status, etc. And those are the people who might get to mar sorry, not mono individual. I call it mono individuation. Um, natural individuation. They might get to natural individuation, but it's probably going to be later on in their life when they're 50, 60, 70. And then you've got the the large, well, not the larger portion of society. Well, yeah, kind of a larger portion of society in which don't have a transcendent meaning end up just going down a job or career for the sake of it uh they're quite un maybe quite unhappy they're not ne they might be aligning with some of our instincts um they might have some intelligence they might not have much intelligence their instincts may have differentiated in a way that aligns with them being at, let's say um some bottom half of of uh, a society or of um uh, or of a culture, they may actually have some level of instinctual alignment, um, but they don't necessarily earn a crazy amount of money, they don't necessarily earn high status, and while a large portion of them may get to natural individuation, if the speaking of the ones within that large percentage of people who have actually um aligned with their instinctual phenomenon quite well even if they haven't necessarily got to some level of transcendent meaning with things and some level of unegoic meaning um 
then you know some portion of them are gonna gonna get to uh, natural individuation. But again, it's going to be towards the end of the life, and uh, and a good portion of them might never get to individuation as well. Um, so you can see that there's like these these four levels to it. And the weirdest level is that level which I'm at, where I've got my transcendent meaning, but yet I'm uh, I have not got status or I've not got money, which is which is weird because you think, well, those people are in a weird branch of society. They've got strong instinctual alignment. They've got um, uh, the, therefore they've got like a transcendent meaning based on that, uh, and they've. Uh, possibly got some sort of man uh, sorry, natural individuation or even conscious individuation slightly earlier but yet they've not got to that level but it is possible although i couldn't say for certain and i don't want to say for certain because i don't think it is for certain that those with the transcendent meaning that aren't in the top of society are actually those who will become the top of society and replace the ones who are there now. I, I don't know, but it, it seems that might be the case. It's we. I, I can't. I don't think it's fully the case. I don't think it's fully the case. But I think for certain people it is, but not for everyone. Because if we're actually to think that that transcendent meaning without, let's say, the status or the money, is a lot bigger of a band than the actual smaller band of the people with transcendent meaning, unegoic meaning, and, and are at the top of society in terms of status and money, then we could argue for the fact that actually, yes, it is only a small portion of these that go towards that, and then the rest of them stay there in that band. But anyway, um, that's that. So I think I've covered most things. I think I'm practically there, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pause the video now and I'm going to come back and I'm, uh, and I'm going to think, I'm going to have a think at what other things potentially I may need to cover and may need to actually um, look into very, very briefly just in this video, um, just so that then I can feel as if I've, I've really covered as much as I possibly could in this video. I think um, what I'll do to finish is generally talk about my own experience with Jungian psychology in a practical manner. So I've, I've touched there on kind of the practical understanding or rather the empirical understanding of the instincts within our psychology and the archetypes working within our psychology. Um, but I think just ending on a little bit of my journey and a little bit of the kind of the experiences that I've had with Jungian psychology might be a good way to finish. And again, it brings us back to that kind of grounding of the concepts actually being utilised and or being looked at um, rather than just the intellectual understanding of them. And um, that's what I have advocate in Jungian psychology, the, the actual practical understanding of them rather than too much of an intellectual um uh, getting too much tied up in uh, intellectual concepts and things like that um, because after all I, I study Zen and things like that and so concepts are just you know you don't you don't you don't like concepts when you when you're into Zen so um, obviously I've been doing it for quite a while now and Obviously, my spiritual journey started way back when, you know, three, four years ago. But the Jungian stuff didn't really come around till maybe two years ago, something like that. So it was quite ironic because I had gone through a partial part of a spiritual journey. And um, so I had already in one sense already integrated certain things within my unconscious based on my understanding of spirituality and understanding of Zen and Taoism and things like that and I was able to psychically flow shall we say so flow with the unconscious in a certain way because of just uh, absorbing in Taoist concepts um, but it really started 
and it was probably more like two and a half years ago now actually when I started doing my dream diary and started writing in there every single day and introspecting every single day and to give you an idea of how much it takes and how much you have to do obviously if you haven't already check out um my video i think it's the experience of zen i think it's got i think that's the one where i talk about my spiritual journey as well as like just general kind of zen concepts and so yeah i think it is it's another long video it's about two hour two and a half hour video but it's it's very interesting i go a bit in depth on certain things uh, specifically centered around de zen and a bit of Taoism in there as well i believe and of course the spiritual journey i went through so um I was going through that and I was trying to do all the Taoist and Zen stuff and I was trying to learn about Jungian psychology and uh, I was all all of this time I was still trying to do my business, my reselling, I was trying to do, uh, I was looking in also as we got closer to where we are now, I was looking into going to university and now of course I'm at university um, and university has been part of my circambulation out of any sort of neurosis towards a uh, flowering into something that we could call individuation which is way off in the future so um that's been kind of a part of it but i was I, I was keen to understand myself not just from the zen side of things or from the Taoist side of things but from a psychological viewpoint so i started down writing down just things that i was aware of and this is a good starting point with Jungian psychology write down little things that you may think are little prob you know problems quote unquote problems of your own that you may have um and start to just subtly introspect around them and then you know just write that every day for a little while and then you start to get a bit of an understanding you get a you get a glimpse into your unconscious shall we say and it's a nice little subtle way to start so i was writing that down in my phone notes and then I started doing dreams, and at first I would write, you know, just write down the odd dream. I wouldn't write down every one of them or anything. And so I wrote down one or two, and I started to realise that there's certain archetypes here that are, uh, that are needing expression. And I could, I had, I've always had this ability, even when I was younger, because I remember some of my dreams from when I was like 13, 14, 15 to dream collective dreams and archetypal dreams i'm very good at uh, i've just got because i've got high trait openness i'm just very good at dreaming imaginative and fantasy based dreams um and so uh i was able to dream some of these dreams and then i could see the archetypes and i went oh this is interesting this is very interesting and and so i would try to interpret and it was horrific horrific interpretation at the start um and the dreams you know some of them were were large some of them were short um certainly obviously the archetypal ones were slightly larger but this is the weird thing when i started interpreting dreams practically every day so i would have a dream every night and then interpret it or a dream every couple of nights then interpret it and then there was a stage just literally that's just gone uh late last year late 2020 where i was dreaming every single day L literally like mul almost multiple dreams a night and this happened for a few months and it was a real crazy experience and i had to write them down write them down bear in mind i'm doing my university course at the same time as this i'm doing all the other bits and bobs that i do and i'm writing my book revelations of set of the self the one thing that i would say is that um if ever you're gonna know a subject this is just speaking out of turn philosophically i suppose just uh not out of turn but just on the side you know philosophically if ever you're gonna do something in a subject and you want to be really good at it you basically just have to work like crazy and it burns you out to hell it burns you out to hell but you see it i don't really I used to be quite egoic with it and I used to be like I want to show people that I'm working and I want to be like look at me I'm working I'm doing all this and now I'm just like look even if I'm very full of, fully aware that even whether people know about it or whether people don't know about it I'm 
more of a, someone who works a lot. I, I hesitate to call myself a workaholic, and that's probably the reason why I am a workaholic, because those who hesitate to call themselves things generally are the thing they hesitate to call themselves. Um, but I hesitate to call myself a workaholic because I don't feel like it specifically, although I do do, I think, I feel, think compulsively, and from a scholarly point of view, I, I do... I possibly should consider myself a workaholic, or even just from a general view. Um, I mean, it's bloody half ten at night, and I've been doing these videos today. I've done my lectures today um, at university, and now I've been doing most of the evening spent doing videos. Y you know, I mean, most people would just, I suppose, be watching TV or something like that. But I have this compulsion, this instinctual compulsion, this sagacious compulsion to, to do these things. Uh, and so, anyway, um, I don't know where I was going with it. Oh, yeah, so I had these, I was getting more and more of these dreams, and uh, and then, obviously, you, you, you build up this um, brilliant, intuitive, well, I'll, I'll use a Jungian phrase, intellectual intuition. That's a phrase that Jung used. Um, that's kind of a little bit um, deeper knowledge on Jungian psychology. I don't think... Unless you really know Jungian psychology, you won't know that phrase. So it's uh, quite a, a nice little hidden gem, that one. Um, but intellectual intuition, and, and Jung talks about this being uh, the way in which, in his terms, if you're an intuitive type, um, then you would be able to intuitively discern uh, certain things in topics that you have haven't really looked into that much so you could you could let's say you've maybe watched one documentary on Friedrich Nietzsche right I, I probably pronounced his name wrong at the start there but you've watched one documentary but suddenly because your instinctual structure aligns with his you can almost intuitively fill in little gaps and you know a little bit more than you should know in a way so that's intellectual intuition this being able to see down the road a little bit being able to see a little bit further just by in, uh, intuition alone and it's very very true and it's very very powerful and many people don't actually consider it or think about it that much it's an incredibly powerful resource um and i seem to have it in in a good there's a, there's a good storage there of intellectual intuition for me so so that's a good thing um, because it means that, like, you, imagine you've got this, you've got this ball, and this represents your knowledge, and imagine you've got this other ball that's slightly lighter in shade, that's your intuition, your field of intuition, and that's your field of knowledge, so your field of intuition almost is like a, a slightly lower field of knowledge, but that allows you to see a little bit further, it's brilliant. Um... But anyway, you, you build up this uh, intellectual intuition with regards to your dreams and with regards to interpretation and with regards to your own unconscious in which you get to a point in which you have a dream and it's a weirdest thing. You don't even need to interpret it in a formal manner because you already know what it means placed in the context of your own individualized psyche. And that can only ever happen, by the way, for your own personal dreams and because you know you can get to the stage in which you know yourself uh to a to a level unconsciously and unconsciously uh, that is transcendent of um well well it's just a, a transcendent level really at an incredible level so then you can understand all of the different nuances that your psyche does and what it likes to place in dreams and how it likes to do things and then you can extract from that meaning quite easily uh, and so you don't need to formally in interpret dreams in an incredibly hard way i mean certainly there are quite a lot of dreams that can be more hard and more tricky to interpret but there's a lot of dreams that i get now because i've been really focused on dream interpretation like crazy um that I can just intuitively, I know, I just know what my psyche is telling me because it's just, ex it's exactly as Jung says, when you get to a certain level of personality development, 
all of the focus is on the self on the total of one's personality and so with me now there's a few little complexes that I have that are, are not fully dissolved and my psyche is bestowing me dreams all the time solely based around those few little things that I've got left and so I know what it wants me to do and there's still little elements with me of, of ego resistance just still little bits and bobs um, because you know you're always going to be a bit imperfect it's just the nature of life it's fine so there's little bits of ego resistance with me that are just not being able i'm not quite there yet but given enough time given a little bit more circambulation i'll get there and i'll get to the self and a powerful point of of um of um circambulation is its ability to create acceptance within you so you might go round and then you might go back on yourself in some sort of failure for example you might have you, you might be having panic attacks and you go out there and you try and do something one day and you fail and you have a panic attack and you go back and then you sit and cry for a few days or you wallow for a few days and then you go out there again and maybe you do something and you get a little bit further with it you spend a little bit longer outside the house or you spend a little bit longer at a certain meeting that you go into or whatever it may be and then you go back and you go forward and you're going back and you're going forward and you're going back like that um and what happens is over time within the context of this circambulation your acceptance for doing the things that your psyche has to do that are quite hard for you to do because let's say you have a dream and it's and you've got a medical complex and it says um you know there's, there's something in your psyche that you, you need to do for example it bestows something in a dream and it says you need to do this x thing and you'll interpret it as such and you can't really do it well what will happen is over time you'll have certain dreams and that will influence your behaviour and you'll start to become naturally more accepting of doing that thing and then you'll finally do it. Um, and then obviously it's there and you've you've overcome it and you've you've got to that level and then you've you've become closer to the self because of that. Um, so that's very that's very interesting. Um, and so we have these this patterning system over a period of time that gets closer and closer to this ultimate goal of your your total personality and that is working it almost feels as if it's working from the beginning from the moment you're born and it's developing you it's developing you and then you obviously you may get some complexes or whatever in your youth and then what happens is things are being built up in the unconscious to help get you over those complexes then you start to um your behavior starts to change and other archetypes slowly bleed into your consciousness and then it gets you over some egoic uh, things neurosis and psychosis or whatever or things like that and then through that kind of um crisis you you get over that and you get closer and closer and closer to the self and by the time you are 40 or 50 or so because jung always talks about individuation being for the more latter part of life because it's in a flowering of your personality and it takes time to grow into your own personality and to grow into life so then you, you but then you get to that and so um it's a slow process and it but it's also one that you can recognize and that you can discern uh, well recognize and discern are the same word aren't we i only need to choose one um you can recognize the process going up like that and you can recognize also the subtle nuances that the psyche is your unconscious mind is bestowing to you in dreams and you think oh I, I know what might be coming in the future i know what possibly is uh, where I need to go and so I'm going to grab that with both hands and uh, I'm going to go in line with my unconscious mind instead of fighting it because obviously at the, at, at the start when you're getting these dreams and you're interpreting them and you're thinking oh crap that can't be the right interpretation but maybe it is the right interpretation and it's something not very nice or it's something that um, maybe reveals to you something not very nice uh, there'll be a lot of ego resistance there. In fact, you won't accept in consciousness 
most of the unconscious contents. What will happen is you will get bestowed them in a dream. You may interpret it, but then they'll go they'll go back into your unconscious. They'll get suppressed, and then you'll you'll have to work through them again. And you'll go through periods, maybe you know, if you're within a neurosis specifically, of crying and psychological turmoil and um, all these kind of things in which are. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm just getting a knock at the door. One sec. Right then, we are back. That was just one of my flatmates. So, um, you'll go through periods with all these different things. You'll also go through periods in uh, with things that I've conceptualised as psychological cringes or psychological screams. Now, I've not found in Jung psychology or Freud psychology, bear in mind I've not read much of Freud. I've only read a couple of his books, maybe two or three of his books. I've read more of Jung, of course. But I've also read some Frankel and some other psychology, and of course I am doing psychology, and I've not found anywhere a concept for this. It may come into another concept that I'm not aware of. So if it does, which it probably does, that's fair enough. But my concept of the psychological scream or the psychological cringe is where you have an investment of psychic energy into a specific person, object, thing, whatever it may be, a cafixis or however you pronounce it in the Freudian terminology, um, and upon a stimulus of that presented in a certain way to you, you'll cringe, you'll like do this as if your psychology is being attacked and you'll, you'll cringe or you'll cringe and you'll scream at the same time, you'll, you'll be like, Get out, you know, like you, you grab your head like that and you'll be like, ah, like that. Or, you know, so it's a psychological scream. And it's where, because that thing is so highly constellated in your unconscious, because there's a complex tied to that uh, specific external person, place, whatever it may be, uh, and there's an investment of such psychic energy in that, it... it your mind can't take it, and so you just have to like cringe or scream, and so there'll be a lot, of, a lot of that in there. But it's through all this and through all the circambulation that then you get closer and closer, and you get out of it, um, and then you can you can realise actually a, an attainment of a superior personality because uh, of the. It's almost like putting manure on a field to so that then the flowers grow better or the crops go grow bigger and better. If you have pain in your life it's no secret the buddhists say it all the time or you know Taoist zen guys say it all the time it's even coming into western ph philosophy now as well or or, or western uh, general thought processes if you have a lot of pain in your life if you have a lot of suffering that's going to transform into a uh, something positive something good something something nice now of course on the flip side to that, someone who's had a lot of pain and who have had a lot of um, issues in their life, it's very much the case that they can go down a very, very dark route as well. But there's always the two, isn't there? There's always the positive and the negative angle. There's always two sides to every story. So, you know, but generally it can make people, turn people into very, very strong personalities, positive personalities when they have had a, a really rough time of it. And they can be actually quite kind people and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, so so it really is an, an odd experience. And I want to just touch upon as well, finally, uh, some other parts of my experience. So obviously synchronous experiences I have them all the time. I have them every day. I have them every bloody single day. Whether it be whether, whether it could be put down to coincidence in a lot of circumstances, I believe it could, um, or whether it is actually genuine, genuinely synchronous, which I do believe that there is some genuine, genuinely synchronous experiences in my life. I have to be very, very careful because I can let my wishful thinking dictate me a little bit and I like to think spiritually and I like to think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this was the case? But sometimes I let that dominate me a bit. I think actually a lot of my synchronous experiences are coincidence, but I do believe, as I say, that some of them, some of the bigger ones are genuinely synchronous. And I've got some uh, examples which are actually incredibly ridiculous synchronous experiences and almost just 
bang it in your face and say, well, it's a reality. Um, so, um, yeah, I think my, my subjective experiences on that do taint my ability to be incredibly objective. Um, but certainly, you know, I do believe that I've had some, some, um, good synchronous experiences. Now, um, with regards to prospective dreams as well, which also can be, uh, well, which also fall into synchronicity, essentially. I've had a lot of prospective dreams. Generally, when you get prospective dreams, you can metaphysically interpret or intuit, I suppose, um, when it's a prospective dream and when it's not a prospective dream. You can start to get good at that and you can start to actually wake up from a dream and you think, oh, there's a prospective element to that. And so then you're going about your daily business. You're obviously not kind of influencing it because you don't know how it might happen anyway. But, or you might have some idea based on the circumstance, but you're not really necessarily doing that. But you're just going about your life and then the situation arises and it's a weird, bizarre thing, but it always holds some meaning. It always holds some uh, information, some, some life, some weird... Uh, numinous, numinous feeling. Um, now, uh, I've had quite big perspective dreams, uh, and then I've had some slightly lesser perspective dreams, and some of them have been, oh wow, that really makes me feel this perspective dream idea is is uh, very much uh, rational in a sense and then there's other times that i have had perspective dreams where i think well you know it's probably a bit of wishful thinking and stuff but of course because causality is as i mentioned in in the maybe it was the zen video causality every cause has to is fated to have an effect and every effect is has to become a new cause and so the entirety of time and space expressed in causal terms is actually one whole entity so if we are to take it as such then it is exactly rational to have future dreams prospective dreams are what's known as future dreams uh, because you're as soon as you are born you're destined to die you're fated to die so therefore in the experience of uh, kind of this causal fatalism, let's say. All of causality is one experience happening happening at a single point. And that means that um, you're already dead, you've already died because you're fated to have, uh, because you're fated to as soon as you're, you're alive and because that co that effect of you dying has to become a new cause and therefore it's one, one single entity. And so, um, that means that it's exactly rational for you to have a future dream that is basically a manifestation from the psyche that is coming back through the timeline that there isn't even actually a timeline because it's all just one entity anyway. It's all of this right now, all of this, all of these items here and all of my uh, time in terms of me actually expressing things right now in this present moment is an illusion. It's all sim all of time and space is happening at one single moment, and this in itself is just an illusion. Philosophically speaking, you can make a very very powerful argument for that. You know, the physicists and the scientists always um and all about it because they always like to have um, quite a lot of. Uh, reservation with these things because they're always thinking well we've got to prove it we've got to make sure we prove it but i like to just prove things a lot of the time with with incredibly awesome logic and then just say there you go you know can you not just add that because look it is bloody brilliant logic but no one ever has it you know because they're like oh no we need to make sure this is all proven and all da 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 but anyway that being said um so you know we can then see that the 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 perspective dream comes back through the causal timeline to produce itself there and this conception goes within the Unas Mundas because if you've got the Unas Mundas working as one world to align up causality and to line up these synchronous experiences where someone has a dream one day and then uh, some sort of weird meaningful coincidence will happen the next day which aligns to that dream we can see that the Unas Mundas is a system 
or as, as an entity um, is the very thing that can orchestrate such um, a phenomena of that happening of that that dream being bestowed to you before the thing has actually happened within your causal chain and so therefore you you get the idea that perspective dreams can very much become a reality now it does annoy me um that a lot of people tend to be quite stupid and not and don't see these things um but that's been the story of my life for a lot of the time and it's very it's something that i have to be very very careful of because i have a very very large shadow and i have a very I have a, can, can quite have a lot of aggression and assertion in that shadow and um i can certainly project that assertion because of certain disintegration uh, certain ideas of disintegration with my own intelligence and with my own comfortability with my own intelligence I can certainly project that onto people who are who I deem not intelligent and that that's a negative thing in itself and I've got to be careful of that but at the same time I've got to allow myself the ability to be able to do that because otherwise I'm just going to repress it so I've got to kind of it's a weird one I've got to recognize it and allow myself it within consciousness but not allow myself to necessarily reinforce it and, and keep it going rather actually instead slowly dissipate the reinforcement so that then over a very long time period my psyche can dissipate it and then it's no longer there very 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 complex process very very hard very very long to do but that's something that I want to uh, make sure I'm working on. So, um, the perspective dream, the idea of the perspective dream, that's very interesting, and that is something that I've had m multiple experiences of. Um, now, with regards to the self, shall we talk about the self for a minute? Uh, and its expression within individuals. This is a very, very powerful idea. So, the self is the totality of one's personality. That's literally the words that Carl Jung used, the totality of one's personality. But it's also the self as in the universe. We can see it in both ways in Jungian psychology. We can see it as in the self as in the, the, the self as expressed as a total of one's personality, which is a balancing between the unconscious and the conscious mind. And uh, it is a organizing factor that could so be analogized i don't know whether i pronounced that word correctly but could so be be draw, draw an analogy with this the nucleus in a cell so we're all made up of cells and the nucleus in a cell is the organizing principle of the information of that cell and the arrangement of control of that cell and the things within that cell imagine the self being uh the nucleus of your psyche and that is the thing that is um, the orienting factor with your unconscious and your conscious and all the archetypes and all the psychic structures your ego your persona all these things and that's the organizing principle just like in the cell in the single cell of your body of your single animal cell of the nucleus and in drawing such analogy it's almost not an analogy but we can't say it's not an analogy because that would be psychologizing but it almost isn't an analogy because it fits so perfectly into the base nature of what it means to be human from an, an anatomical or physiological level um, so therefore it is a very very powerful uh, analogy that analogy because it aligns so much to what is observable in our physical body and if we are to take a psychology uh, into the future, we must take a psychology that aligns with nature and that aligns with what we can observe uh, objectively elsewhere. And then we can create based on that and, and then we can get some sort of level of alignment with what is actually uh, natural and is actually the case. That's why, again, Jungian psychology is so powerful because all of its concepts 
naturally align up to phenomena in the external world and the analogies and the empirical observations that can be made between all the phenomena of Jungian psychology and the actual reality um, is so powerful and there's so many of them and and so that's why it's such a strong psychology because it's based on reality and based on nature and based on empirical facts um, so the self, that's the self in terms of the totality of one's personality, but just like you've got billions of cells in your own body that create the entirety of you, the universe has billions of cells of rocks, of people, of all, you know, all these different things that make up the universe, of stars, of all this sort of stuff. We are kind of like a, a micro, micro, micro cell in the universe, obviously stars and planets and stuff being a more micro uh, cell and then things lower than that a micro micro cell and then we're like a micro 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 cell and then if we're within let's say our universe is within a multiverse which is very very likely if you look at it logically or philosophically um then uh then basically the universe is might actually be a micro cell in another greater org organism in which every single multiverse is a cell like the cells in our body and therefore we could actually if we fantasize about this and we picture in our mind a, a big massive sheet of universes that all look like cells you see what i mean and our universe is here and then we've got universes all around here and that exactly if you further you go back and the further you see the scope of this thing it the further it actually looks like the cells in our own body, like a patch of our own cells, and then therefore we're, we're aligning with nature quite a lot there. But essentially, the big self is, um, well, you can't even describe it as the universe, because it might be way bigger than that, but that's that would be the big self. So you've got the, the big self, which is like the the totality of everything whatever exists the totality of the whole goddamn system uh, and we're uh, a little self within it and our little totality of personality is being directed not only by the little self nucleus inside our psyche but also by a transcendent full self of the system and so if there's this self of the system which we can observe um quite naturally with some complex philosophical arguments that i'm not going to go into now because it's it's all in revelations of the self but i'm not going to go into it because it's there's long arguments i mean the book's two three hundred pages i'm not going to go into that now but we can observe quite empirically that there is some sort of system whether we can define that system as um as an entity per se or whether we can define that system as a mechanical system such as we say well it was maybe more traditional opinion to say that the universe is a mechanical system um uh, but whatever we want to define it as there is this larger entity this self uh, whether we're going to actually start to pin a anthropomorphic I can't even say that. I'm from all pick uh, angle on that, or whether we want to just mechanize it. It doesn't really matter what sort of angle. But there is this this thing that is transcendent, and so you can actually see this self, this larger self, working through the individual, and you can see this most prevalently in naturally individuated individuals because consciously individuated individuals have conscious awareness of it anyway so the things that they say they're all they're always going to be directed at the conscious uh, progression of the personality development or the spiritual development of uh, any given individual anyway because they're conscious of it and they have certain conscious knowledge that that make that directs them in that way or that compels them in that manner but the naturally individuated individuals who are unconscious of the fact that they are individuated, they say things to people and they, the, the way in which they do things around people that directs and orients the personality development of the indiv other individual. 
and you have to be very very intuitive to pick this up but i've been uh, with certain people before who I've, I've not told them about any of my complexes or anything like that yet they will automatically do things and say things that revol revolve around my own development and what i'm perceiving within them is the larger self at work trying to integrate certain parts of myself and i'm of course doing it quite naturally for other people sometimes quite unconsciously without knowing um, because that's the self working through me but then there's other, and then there's other people who are coming in and doing it for other people and because the universe is an interrelated and interconnected, interconnected system it works out that this has to be the case that we are all having to develop one another because in fact we are one single entity one single energy and so it couldn't be any other way any other case that uh, we couldn't all be interrelated uh, interrelatory uh interrelatorily interrelatorily okay it couldn't be the case that we were all not developing one another in an interrelating fashion because we are that one entity and therefore we we all have to interrelate in a certain manner in in a very fine manner not uh, that a lot of us are unconscious of um and that we can't understand and that is so so fine that uh transcends our, our human minds really or the ability of our human mind to actually dig down and see this. Um, so it would it would make sense that we are all interrelated and we are uh, in that interrelation, we are actually developing one another to get to the self because we are all within that self and the, the, the goal is the attainment of that self consciously as expressed in an individualized um, person, as expressed in, in one mind, a flowering of the mind, let's say. Um, and so that's very interesting because you can see the self working in people and actually you can intuitively realize how these people are developing, you know, naturally individuated individuals are developing other people who are more egoic or who are very, very far from individuation. So you see maybe a natural individuation, individuated individual, let's say they're around a young girl they happen to be a guy, they may use their animus more, just naturally, because it's a compulsion from the self in which the self needs that individual to use their animus more to integrate the young girl who doesn't have much of an integration with the, the overbearing, neg you know, the overbearing side of the animus. And so to integrate that girl, the self must utilize this personality to integrate that personality. And that personality ultimately integrates within a, uh, an interrelated field of other personalities and other experiences. And because of all the causal relationships going out and 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 out, and out um, then all of these interrelations keep happening like this and therefore other people are individual uh, slowly and very 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 finely in a very very fine very very subtle very 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 slow way over a very long time period they're all in individuating each other but unfortunately certain people won't get to individuation for whatever reason it may be one thing we could argue is intelligence that might be an impediment to individuation it's very likely it seems that openness specifically is uh, associated with being able to generate links and being able to therefore attain some level of spiritual um insight and therefore that would get you to individuation so it could be intelligence and openness that, that would impede and if that's the case then um we know that there's a certain um requirement for individuation or a certain demographic for individuation and we also can infer from that the fact that if there is a specific demographic for individuation and there is a demographic that's somewhat harder to individuate or excluded from the, the possibility of individuation for whatever reason for the traits or whatnot then we could infer that the self 
the big self, doesn't want everyone individuated, which would align with the old ideas of the, the Hindu divine play or Maya or things like that or um, Aboriginal dream time and stuff that I've talked about. Um, because, of course, the self, which is a representation essentially in Hinduism of Br Brahman, Brahman wouldn't want the divine play to end, so therefore why would Brahman want everyone consciously individuated or everyone at a stage of practical enlightenment? Because if the entire world was enlightened, there would be no divine play and therefore it must end and therefore the universe must withdraw because otherwise there would be no no point to, to the experience of, of, of the Vishnu Leela, the divine play. So, um, therefore, you know, there's an essay actually by Anilia Jaffrey talking about the individuation of mankind, and I know Jung talks about the individuation of mankind. For me, that's a, that's a hopeless pursuit. And I know also for Alan Watts, Alan Watts talked about um, the fact that, you know, you know, no, not everyone's going to be enlightened because of the divine play. So it seems a hopeless pursuit trying to make everyone individuated or get to some sort of individuation of mankind because... Um, you're not going to do it. You might make X amount of people individuated, but you're not going to make everyone individuated. It just, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the possibility. But also on the flip side of that, Jung did mention, as I mentioned in these videos, that um, not everyone can be individuated. So, I mean, I suppose there's kind of like, you could probably argue that you could get to some sort of individuation of mankind, and maybe that's what what Jung meant, and maybe that's what Anilia Jaffrey meant, that you could get to a level of individuation of mankind that is higher than it currently is. Well, you definitely could get it, get it higher than it currently is. Um, and then that means that in turn the world is a more solidified and conscious place rather than being full of unconscious ind individuals who aren't individuated or, or don't have much psychological awareness or spiritual awareness um so you know there's that possibility in there and that that does suit that that does actually work quite quite well um but yeah we have this kind of idea that um uh, that you know we have we can perceive the self in in individuals and be able to understand it to a to a very um, quite high degree and we have got to be careful with this because there can be some level of um, well I mean you could say there could be some level of psychotic delusion in it because you could say well hang on a minute isn't that just you thinking you're perceiving um, some sort of self in an individual whereas actually you're just being deluded by some sort of idea yes it's possible but I would say that from my own experience and from really being quite intuitive and, and being quite critical of it as well, that actually know that there is this self working in people. It seems very obvious when you're around it for quite a long time and when you can see the dynamics of people and how the self is using the instincts to be able to integrate uh, different individuals over a very very long time period to get them to mar uh, I keep saying mono individuation natural individuation or conscious individuation um so yeah you know um it, it it does seem there is definitely something there um but you've got to be very very careful of how you approach it because yes there could be some level of psychotic delusion in that and if we're going to get into that there's no point in even doing it is there because you're just being deluded um but yeah, I think it's just that um, you kind of have to pick up on it in a subtle way. You have to be critiquing it so that then every time you think that it might be the self working in an individual, then and you can see it clearly, then you have to think, well, is it really that? Is there anything? Is there anything I can pick apart here to pull that down? And um therefore you know is it actually some sort of reality uh, or is it simply you know just a delusion now i'm going to read a little passage from my uh, book that i've mentioned so much of not only in this video but also in other videos i wanted to talk about some sort of um very very deep causal interrelation of dreams now some people might be able to follow this other people might not be able to follow this but I wanted to talk about it anyway because it's a very interesting little passage. So, let us go further into the causal nature of dreaming.
Let us suggest that you are living in a house with four people. You have interactions with those people one morning, which are of course influenced by their current attitude, which to a greater or lesser degree is affected by all the dreams of each in that each individual had the previous night. There is talking going on that stimulates neurons within the brain and indeed plants a memory in the hippocampus or the parahippocampal uh, zone of all involved. Let us suppose that part of this memory is the idea of baking a cake in the afternoon. You all agree to this and of course this is, perspe this is perspective memory. It just so happens that patterning of behaviour that everyone displays, including your own actions upon the environment, goes to produce at some point mid-morning a decision in which arises within a thought to go to your room. You are feeling somewhat tired and you decide to go for a nap. You are having a dream that is created by an organisation of memory and, it, and indeed it is a fairly average dream, but you randomly saw some cake in one of the scenes. The patterning of behaviour and events throughout the day, with, uh, with which you had a causal interrelation and interdependence, has ended up with one of the housemates knocking on your door to ask, would you like to bake the cake? You happen to be in the REM stage of sleep and you get pulled out of the dream, but luckily you can somewhat remember it. Now we cannot state that you would have have had a different dream if different decisions were allowed to have happened, it, but it is very likely you would have done. However, if the cake conversation hadn't come up, which was arrived at by a collective behavioural, mental and physical patterning and experience that so produced such an arrangement of the environment for that thought to manifest itself within your brain, then an element of a dream wouldn't have been present and the behaviour of the others would have been totally different, which could be quantified as having incalculable, incalculable changes to the wider environment of which would never even be aware, of which we would never even be aware. It is quite old and obvious thinking, but I wish to highlight this, is, this to show the incredible level of influence others have on our thought and decision processes, and indeed some of an idea of how dreams can influence conscious life. So, it's basically talking about how all these different things that other people are talking about, all these different causal chains, all these different experiences that you're having with other people go to direct your behaviour and your behavioural processes and behavioural patterns and that bleeds into the dreams that you have and then also that then gets dispensed back out into the external world and then influences other behavior of other people. So everyone you interact with on a daily basis, you're influencing all of their behavior and that in turn is going to influence the manifestation of their dreams which in turn influences their behavior which then the next day inf uh, their behavior based on the dream that was based on the influence of their behavior by you um their new behavior then influences you and uh, and then that influences your own dreams again and so what i'm trying to explain here is this incredibly fine interrelation and interdependence on cause and effect and how it really interrelates to one another and that how certain experiences within your life can produce dreams for you and then those dreams can produce behavior that then um, goes to affect other people and produce dreams for them so it's the entire structure of dreaming from this from this observation is that the entire human race essentially is having one dream that's all in because of all the interrelations and interconnections of behavior by every single organism on the planet every single human organism on the planet um, and therefore every human that has a dream that is behaviorally behaviorally influenced either to a very 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 fine degree or to a larger degree depending on the closeness of the person to that person who's having the dream um, and that dream is then dependent on that it's dependent on everything all of the behavior of mankind and therefore that means that we all of our dreams are connected up and, and it's it's absolutely amazing it's marvelous 
because we see this interconnection and interdependence on one another behaviorally and also you know within our dreams and our unconscious mind and we also see from this idea as well that um, the collective unconscious is a reality as expressed in the interrelation and inter interdependence of behavior on dreams and then dreams uh, on reality on the behavioral reality and we see a a net almost a net going across humanity that is the collective unconscious and so that in itself from a logical viewpoint and a logical argument proves without any other um, arguments necessarily that there is a collective unconscious so I thought I would just add a final thing um, I don't know whether I talked about this in one of the other videos or not but I wanted to talk about the kind of creation of complexes and although I've not really looked into neuropsychology in incredible amounts at the moment as I mentioned I'm doing brain and mind this semester as well which will be good I know a little bit about neuropsychology and when I say a little bit I do mean I've only read one book on it so it's not like I've read about 10 books on the on the subject matter or anything but anyway let's say you've got a kid who specifically has an experience right and he has an experience with a guy who is a big burly guy he's um he, he's kind of physiologically he, he typifies and in his behavior he typifies the animus he typifies the overbearing so it almost sort of a, the stereotypical masculinity or masculine figure and uh He's overbearing and he's this and he's that. And this kid, then what happens is obviously that individual, the, the X straight body area is activated, the amygdala is activated with negative emotion, and that memory is going to be cemented in the hippocampus. Um, and obviously it's going to be repressed as well, sort of, sort of consciously. Uh, but it, it's going to be a negative memory, there's going to be a negative association there. So then let's say another similar experience happens like this in the child's life or numerous experiences like this happen in the child's life where he's being uh there's, there's an overbearing presence of a particular uh masculinity and a particular body shape let's say of an individual those then all go into the hippocampus as negative memories because there's a negative association in terms of negative emotion um and then these can constellate and then form a complex. Now, that specific complex is tied to the instincts that are associated with the animus. And therefore, that individual over childhood can get a repression of centered around the animus or centered around um, the, the instincts for fight. They'll have an aversion let's say they'll have an aversion to that specific instinct because it was so prominent in their childhood and were, was overbearing onto them and so they don't want to associate with that so therefore they're going to repress that but not they're not only repressing the memories associated with that they're repressing that particular instinct that potentially that uh, those experiences contained which w was the animus and the animus associated with the instinct for fight and so therefore among other experiences of course the child then has that association and therefore in uh, years to come they're going to have to work through that and they're going to have some sort of complex um, or constellation of the animus so the, the animus will be highly uh, highly constellated or it'll be um, quite um, unconscious to the individual maybe not quite highly constellated but unconscious to the individual and it'll come out unconsciously um, but it won't be something that they have full awareness of or uh, it won't be something that they um, particularly can control within their behavior or anything like that or or uh, consciously understand within their behavior um, and so that's generally how a complex can form and how it can work because you see there's this real disconnect between um, the behaviorists 
the neuropsychologist and the depth depth psychologist with regard to com with regards to complexes, but they're all explaining a very very similar phenomenon. The fact is, we can term a complex in behaviourist terms within those um, inter 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 interactions there we go interaction i was going to say interrelations interactions we can say well obviously that particular um kind of situation or that particular behavior um is, is punished and there's an aversion to that particular behavior that's built up over the years or we could say uh, and so therefore there's there's these memories in the uh, in the hippocampus that are behavioral that they're kind of um, little behavioural patterns or little behavioural chains, let's say, that there is an aversion to, that they're, uh, therefore the, the behaviour that is taken away from those is reinforced rather than be the, the behaviour towards those being reinforced. So there's a there's a punishing and there's a try there's kind of a um, cordoning off of that particular behavior that that the individual has an aversion to but that in itself is a complex but just expressed in behavioral terms now the neuropsychologist will of course say well it's memories in the hippocampus or it's this or it's that or da 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 it's or it's these six areas that work together and that creates that and then the depth psychologist say well it's a complex but they're all the same thing, they're just explained in different dimensions and it's really bloody frustrating because all the psychologists are like, well, I know my way, I want this way and I'm going to express it in this way because that's the way that I want it to be, when actually it's all the bloody ways, it's just different ways to explain it and everyone's so superfluous because they all have to be very animacy and they all have to have their way of doing it and they have to attach their own conception to it because um, they need to feel as if they need to make their mark on the world but it is in, in effect an, anim an animus phenomena um, and that's quite ironic because that's uh, an instinct and then we come back to the instincts idea um, but no, I wanted to touch upon that because um, it's an important idea with how complexes are formed in such a way and how they can manifest and then therefore how they affect behaviour later on because of um, the, the certain happenings, both archetypal and both uh, neuropsychological, you know, it's, it's one phenomena. Um, but because of that, they they then obviously uh, it means that there is there is a complex there, there is things to be worked through. A lot of people, well, some people like to dismiss the idea of complexes, but there is real you know neuropsychological grounding for complexes, and uh, it would be very very stupid indeed, I think, to dismiss the complex. Um, so. Um, Aside from that, I also wanted to touch on very, very briefly uh, the idea of um, being able to see within people the archetypes and the underdeveloped archetypes that they need to integrate within to their psyche. And this is a brilliant little thing. I love this. So there's, uh, there's a quote out there from a Jungian analyst. And she said, right up until his death, Jung was focused and dedicated to the individual individuation process in others. Now, what that quote means is that Jung would see in people the underdeveloped psychic functions or psychic structures, the anima, the animus, the shadow, whatever. And he would make sure that he would try and integrate those in people. And make sure he was being able to get them to a level of individuation. Now, of course, he'd, he'd do this through his practice and he'd do this through working with people um, through their dreams and through psychoanalysis and all the rest of it. Now, of course, I'm not a psychoanalyst yet. I'm not in that field particularly. Uh, I, I don't I don't practice or anything like that. No doubt I could probably be a pretty good one uh, based on the bloody ridiculous level of experience that I've got now through interpreting my dreams and stuff 
Um, but I'm not a psychoanalyst, but what I do like doing is this within people that I know. So I will actually adapt the psychic structure that I'm displaying because I can, can be conscious of it. Um, and I can then adapt to that psychic structure so that then I can individual, uh, well, not individuate, but get the person slowly, slowly, slowly closer to realizing the psychic structure within themselves. So if I'm around someone who's, you know, a young girl who's quite shy and all the rest of it, I'll be quite anonymous. So that then you, you see they get more familiarity with that. If I'm around someone who's quite anonymous but hasn't got much integration, you, you know, you can perceive that they've not got much integration with their anima, you know, I'll be a bit more calm, anima, feminine-like. And, uh, you know, this is uh, gender fluid. Uh, being gender fluid, I suppose, comes into this really. But, um, or if they're, let's say, they have a certain... Um, let's say they have a particular overbearingness in in thinking or in logic then i'll be quite emotional or if they've got quite a, a emotional character i'll be quite thinking and quite cold and quite so you can do that it's a bit more of a rascal guru approach than anything uh, rather than let's say if you're in a practice of your own and going through dreams and all the rest of it but it's a fun approach nonetheless it's brilliant being able to do it and of course, there's instincts that sometimes overtake me, and sometimes I, I I'm slightly unconscious. And what will happen? And this is it annoys me a bit, but it, you know, it's all part of the process, and it's a bit of fun. Is I realise that I've just you know been taken over by an instinct, particularly maybe it's the joke, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. What you know, an archetypal form, or I'll have lived mainly the one is the anima because I was socialised into it, so I still have a reinforcement around that. But I'll, you know, I'll, I'll live in my anima for a few minutes or a minute or something, and then about ten minutes later or five minutes later, I'll realise I'm like, oh, for God's sake, I was in the anima then, and then you, you know, you have to, you have to get back to it. You know, you have to think, well, right, okay, now that overtook me. So how can I understand how I can get balance back so that then that may not occur again? But the thing is. You all these are always going to occur forever. I'm very well aware of that now. But even if you get to an expression of wholeness in the modern personality, you'll always still be overtaken by an instinct every now and then because the instinct you can never be fully one hundred percent in control of your ego because the unconscious is bigger than your ego, it's more than your ego, and therefore it always kind of pushes something through you and and then uh, you, you've got an instinct there that, that wasn't necessarily in your control, but was you were living within rather than uh, having more of a centered control. But the other thing is actually moving, just moving on from that very quickly and just uh, uh, just for a final five minutes or so. I wanted to talk about Jungians specifically, and it, you know it's uh, it's good to touch upon this actually as well. So. Jungians these days, modern Jungians, right? So you look at Jung and you look at Marie Louise von Franz and other people in the Jungian tradition who were the first generation of Jungians, right? 1930s, 40s, 50s, that sort of time period um, at Bollingen. And they don't really hold back. They're not, you know, Jung on interviews, he'd get a bit annoyed or he'd, he'd, he'd have a giggle and he'd be like that and he he wouldn't necessarily hold back the archetypes you can see in him that he's got a natural sense of uh, presence a very very strong natural sense of presence but he wasn't holding back the archetypes or anything like that he was he'd he'd, he'd live a little bit in the animus or he'd live a bit in the, this or this archetype because he was very fully well aware of it, the fact that trying to hold back the archetypes denotes a sort of fear of the archetypes and if you have a fundamental fear of the archetype then of course you're living in an archetype within that fear obviously but also you're you're not really fully integrated with the archetypes you see one who's fully integrated with the archetypes would in fact live out the archetypes for what they're worth um not necessarily in an idea of complete overtaking by the archetypes that strips you of any individuality you see that would be that would be a, a that would be unfortunate that would be something that's that that's too much on one extreme 
but certainly certainly the individual who's integrated with the archetypes utilizes the archetypes in an individualized setting or or naturally unconsciously uh, the archetypes come through them in a, in a in the correct way it's not something that you know when you're integrated with the archetypes you're just this stone person who is very quiet and very like this and and very zen because what what the hell right so so you're trying to be zen because you're like you're like this this is just trying to be zen it's not zen that's that's bloody the the opposite of being zen that's the complete opposite of being zen if you're trying to hold back any instinctual drives or compulsions being zen means going with the instinctual compulsions to the point it means to go with them um and i see a lot in modern Jungians, this very reserved attitude, and they talk really slowly, and they talk as if they're almost in some state of bliss like this, and actually it's more because they don't want to be taken over by an archetype, or they're, they're not going to be taken over by, I'm not going to be taken over by an archetype, and they, they have this really slow speech, and we all know from from Jung's writings that he was a bit of a cheeky guy. He, he, the way he writes, you have this sense of a certain connection with the wonder of the child and the child archetype and and also a little bit of that jester or joker archetype at times. He's a bit of a He's a bit of a rascal, and um, and he, he wasn't afraid to go with the archetypes. It, it was uh, said in a, a documentary, actually, that he, he had a party one time. No doubt he had other parties as well, but he had a party one time, and someone who went to this party, one of the analysts, I assume, uh, said that basically young let the party go a little bit, let the party decay into the shadow a little bit, because Jung knew that, that that's the thing that makes a good party, if it's a bit shadowy, if it's a little bit uh, over the top. And you see, a lot of the Jungians these days, they, they, they seem to get, they, they, they try and hold the archetypes. What's, what's the point? What, you know, live the archetypes, enjoy the archetypes, be within the in the instinctual direction that you specifically are, are, are directed in. For me personally, that's the sage, that's the, the child, that's the um, the um, joker as well, you know, the, the sage, child, joker, and, and also the hero as well, they're like my four really. Um, and so I, I live them, I live them, and I live them in the confines of my individualized personality rather than in a collective manner that where i'm just literally jumping into the instincts and just being completely compelled by the instincts like the conception of the mythic man in jungian psychology which is the idea that there's always this unconscious uh fantasy playing out it's playing out in the almost a pre-conscious in a way and uh, it comes into your consciousness and it manifests in all sort of fantasies and ideas on reality that could potentially happen, that are potential possibilities for what you could do. So, you know, you're sat around a table and there's some sort of uh, bowl of sweets or something, and you get this fan random fantasy pop-up and you think, uh, and you, you see yourself grabbing the sweets and just chucking them all over the room. That's the mythic man. Or you walk down the street and you randomly get this fantasy to whack in a car window or something. That's the mythic man. That's the pure psycho-instinctual, that's the archetypal phenomena really showing themselves in prominence. And, of course, a lot of that is, the, is tied to the trickster archetype. The trickster is very much in line with the mythic man because the mythic man is the thing that is constantly there in the unconscious or in pre-conscious or even in the conscious in consciousness um, that is always the trickster, that is the divine trickster trying to get out, that, that is that instinctual phenomenon that tries to get out. And you see, that's the, the mistake if you overdo it if you overdo the collective nature of the archetypes and you just literally become an archetype 
and that's not instinct that's not individualized you see but there but we can also argue that there is within certain individualized personalities more of a propensity to be more like a mythic man for example and then that's not Technically, that's not so bad, so long as the individual is still an individual of, of sorts and he's not too aligned with that collective archetype. Like I myself, I consider my, myself uh, a bit of a trickster, a bit of a joker, a bit of a, a rascal. Um, but I never quite get to that realm of mythic man in its entirety. Sometimes I'll do little mythic man-like things, but I won't ever do it in its entirety, I won't ever go crazy with it all 24-7 like some sort of person just in, absorbed into the archetypes, you know, um, but there is that, that in there, so we've got to be careful of, of that as well, um, but the Jungians do, they do kind of just sit there and, uh, you know, the other thing that gets me with Jungians as well at the moment is this bloody idolization of young and, I, and we all do it i'm not trying to say that i've not done that i've done that i've done that to a bloody ridiculous degree but i think it's because i have done it to a ridiculous degree over a year or two like you know every day this very very powerful idolization and weeding him and and absorbing in interviews and really having a very fixed idolization of him i think you know obviously it, it's it's been burnt through with me a little bit but we have this terrible idolization of him, as if he's some sort of Christ figure. It's like, look, okay, he was a brilliant man. We all know he was a brilliant man. He could do so much. I didn't actually talk about the fact at the beginning that he, he, he could do brilliant artwork as well. He was a brilliant artist. So the amount of things that he could do, it was incredible. Of course, he is. if you're going to idolize anyone, of course, yeah, you know, picking him is a good option. But... Look, would would Jung really want that? You see, his whole tenet of philosophy, of his psychology was individuation, not following people necessarily, but an individual being an individual in your own right, and and therefore it, it seems it seems a bit silly or or insulting to idolize him to such a degree. Um, of course, he expected those in the future to idolize him at first and to realize that he was this kind of or to think that he was this guru like figure that's just part of being what it means to be let's say a Jungian even though I wouldn't consider myself a Jungian per se but that's what it means to follow Jungian psychology it's part of the the initiation process if you will but we have to get beyond that we have to adapt the ideas, we have to create new ideas based on Jungian psychology. We can't just be a follower, we can't just be someone who idolizes this man as a father figure or anything like that. We have to get past that and expand on the ideas and create our new ideas with it with regards to, to Jungian psychology and um, and other areas of psychology. And I think it, it's all too easily done these days with Jungians that they um, just honestly, they just they have this compulsion to idolize Jung, and uh, and you just see it even in older some of the older Jungian analysts, they just idolize him, and it's like, why, you know, why not be your your individual? Why not? You see, this is the route that for a long time I was thinking, oh, I'll be a Jungian analyst, and maybe I will. I, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna be a Jungian analyst. Maybe I will go down the route of being a Jungian analyst. I don't know what what the future holds or where I'll go, but I'm starting to think maybe I should be I would be better going down my own route rather than being a Jungian psychologist, but just be a psychologist in general who practices partially in a Jungian way and partially in uh, slightly other ways. Maybe a behaviorist way or maybe in you know, slightly other ways, maybe utilize certain neuropsychological concepts or whatever it may be, uh, or just general um, things from the research, from the scientific research that we know to be helpful within psychology. For example, mindfulness and things like that. You could obviously put that into a clinical setting. Um, and of course, exposure therapy as well. That's a powerful one. Um, so, you know, I've thought about that and I think, well, 
if we really think about what Jung talked about, about individuation and becoming an individual, it means just that. And it doesn't mean idolising, it doesn't mean going down the same path as anyone. And it's funny, he did say that as well in somewhere, I can't remember where it was, it was in some book of his or some essay of his, but he said that my path is different from yours. Um, and it's very true that we can't ever follow in the tracks of Jung. Just as Heraclitus said, no man can step in the same river twice, we can't follow the steps of Jung, we can't be Jung. And um, so therefore, we must follow our own path. And that, that is the brilliance, that is the beauty of life and the beauty of existence, following our own path. Um, and becoming who we are in our in our own right, whether that be a psychologist or whether a psychologist be a, a facet of that person, uh, whether that be a philosopher or whether that be uh, an engineer or whether that be um, a, a data person, what they're called, I don't know, a, a data entrier or that was terrible, wasn't it? I don't know what those people do, but I'm glad they do it because I wouldn't want to do it and it means that I can actually go online and go on the internet and use computers um, and thank God their kind of path, their instinctual direction through life has compelled them in that direction because God knows I would not want to do that. So big up those guys, the data entry guys or whatever they're called. Um, but yeah, so... Um, it is about that. It is about going down your own path. So uh, I'll leave it there then. Uh, I'll probably fit this in before the other the other clip. Um, uh, so there might be a little bit more to come after after this clip. So I will leave you with the remainder of the video. Or if this is the end of the video, I will see you in the next one. See you very soon, guys.